Cool. Well, man, Zach Fleer, good to get you in here, man. It's great to be here, man. It's a sweet studio. It's always good to be on the west side of Columbus. And, uh, oh, yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity, man. It's going to be fun. I appreciate you, man. Uh, like I kind of told you a little bit about before the podcast, man, I love what you're doing. Uh, those are the kind of guests I've been trying to get on, people that I really love what they're doing, what they're putting out. And uh, it seems to be uh, a lot of stuff that I'm interested in and a lot of positive stuff and uh, inspiring stuff, man. And uh, I, I really like what you're doing to try to create opportunity for the kids yep. on the West Side and, and especially in basketball, something that's close to my heart as well. Yeah, so it's it's been a long, wild ride. It's been about six years since I started, but um, you know, 270 Hoops as a whole has really grown and picked up a lot of momentum, you know, in Central Ohio and across the rest of the state, really. So uh, to see the growth and you know to see all the kids that were able to you know put on a spotlight and put on a you know a bigger platform has been pretty fun. So I don't take it for granted. You know, it's definitely um, you know the situation and the the platform I built for myself is something that is really a blessing. So. I embrace every day, you know, getting a chance to help these kids out and, you know, create environments and events and uh, things where they can, you know, play to their potential. And really, it changes a lot of these guys' lives when, um, you know, they maybe get that scholarship offer they've been working for or, you know, get noticed, you know, at a level they may not have expected or hadn't, you know, experienced before. So, yeah, I mean, when I when I was younger, I don't remember anything like this. I mean, of course, social media and all the that this stuff it wasn't around at the time, but definitely even past that, you know what I mean? Just in general, someone who's trying to do that type of thing and trying to make sure that people have that spotlight to get that attention. Yeah, when I, I mean, even when I graduated in 2011, like if you had a highlight tape, you had to be a stud. I mean, you had to be exactly division one prospect, you know, bunch of schools looking at you. Now, I mean, I see like JV highlight tapes now. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that, but right, right. You know, every kid, you know, with sources like Huddle and resources like that, you know, the exposure's out there. So it's yeah, I, I see it. I see that at every level, man. I, I see it like you're saying. You third say, grade football oh, yeah. tapes. Oh, I see them young. I you see, see young. dads but the same arguing t- about whose five U team is better. Right, right. But at the same time, <laughs> man, I feel like it's been beneficial for some too. Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, that kid, Sean Jones. Sean Jones, yeah. I I followed him just because I think somebody tagged me or I maybe I saw somebody like something years ago, man. And he was just a young little small Since fourth dude. grade. Like his, yeah. I followed his mom on Instagram in like fifth grade, and she yeah. been sending me some of his clips. So for him to be a freshman, he actually played in my intro event back in August um, for Rising Freshmen. Was the first year we did it. It was my first chance to really see him up close and personal because I tried not to, you know watch and hype any kids before high school i don't want to you know maybe hype a kid up too early and you know maybe change his course of you know where he's going so um for sean that was really cool to see a guy that has come up in that era where he's been on instagram you can still find his clips from third and fourth grade um and he's got like twelve thousand instagram followers like this kid yeah i think the other day some uh a post or something from slam hit right yeah. and what really blew yeah. him up it's crazy i mean it gave me chills just now with you talking about like uh to see him get to go through that process like and, and know that you followed him from that time and then to see things happen for him what, how that feels good for you because I think that feels good like I'm even for speaking for myself specifically yep. I'm I was no way shape or form a part of it but just to follow it through the process right. has been cool for me so I can't even imagine on your end or other people's end that are somewhat involved to really see it happen and see how much it like some f- fulfillment but also just joy you get from just getting to witness the process just, um, it's amazing I mean I think back you know, there's a couple of recruiting processes that I've either been a part of or helped chronicle that um, have been really cool. Jerome Hunter, who's a freshman at Indiana right now. I remember seeing him in eighth grade. This was this would have been, um, I think, 2014. So about May 2014, he's playing in um, some middle school all-star game at Howard Rec. It was the day before Easter, I believe. And there's this lanky eighth grader, and he dunks. He was the only kid, even in the high school game, only person that dunked in the, in the, both game, in the two games there. Um, and I went down to the bench. I was like, who is that kid? They're like, yeah, I think his name's Jerome. I was like, what's his last name? So I, they told me, Jerome Hunter, he goes to Monroe Middle School. And I was like, okay, I'm going to tweet about this kid. And I was like, keep an eye out for 2018, which back then it was like, man, 2018 so far, so far <laughs> yeah, away. Sure. Um, you know, small forward Jerome Hunter, big time athleticism, lots of upside. And to see him, you know, go from that point where he was still – you know, a little uncoordinated, um, you know, struggled to walk and chew gum at some time. So right, right. Um, to see him really develop and add more to his game and then blow up and, you know, commit to Indiana and now, you know, have a chance to you know play for them very early on um, to be a part of that process. And um, just to watch that kid just develop. It's really fun. You know, it, the fulfillment's there. Obviously, um, it's just 
seeing lives change and kids really live out their dreams is really fun. So that's, oh, it has that's to part be I love about it. It has to be amazing. But before we get too f- much farther in it, so then let's go back, man, for the people that don't know who you are. I, I same way. I mean, I want to know as well, too, because I just know the basics of uh, what I know from you on social media and the little bit that we talked before the podcast. But uh, kind of give people an idea of uh, who you are with uh, where you grew up and uh, how and the people around you, things like that. Just... M- for the most part, where and uh, some of the small, okay. de- those smaller details. Yeah, so my name is Zach Fleer. I'm the owner, um, co-founder of 270 Hoops, uh, 270hoops.com. We cover Central Ohio High School basketball. Um, we're coming up on our third season. Or actually, it'll be our fourth season, um, but it's, the company's about to turn three years old here in November. And it's a free service. You know, the website, we provide coverage, all types of articles, and, um, you know, power rankings, team rankings throughout the season. And it's really a vehicle for you know, kids to be seen in this area to receive, you know, exposure and be covered at a level that really wasn't happening before we came along. Um, so that's the goal behind that. But my, you know, where I come from, I've been, you know, Columbus native forever. Uh, family's based on the West side, went to Central Crossing High School, graduated in 2011, uh, played, you know, multi sports back in high school. I was mainly a baseball guy in high school. Um, you know, after my sophomore year, really committed to baseball. Um, so basketball, you know, to come up. So I was always around Westland High School. Um, you know, my parents went there. My dad used to coach baseball there. I played Legion baseball there. So I was always kind of partial to Westland too. And this is 2013. I'm a sophomore at Ohio State. And Westland's like 4-0. and And they had these two seniors on the team, uh, Devin Williams and Akiwan Grace, that used to live in my neighborhood on Houghton Alcar near Central Crossing that had transferred to Westland. They were both seniors. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go watch Westland. They're 4-0. and uh, You know, just see what they're like. And it was almost an accident. It was, it was an accident. It's not even an almost. Um, go up to Thomas Worthington. They're playing there. And Kiwan's brother, Shawan, I went to high school with him. He was two years older than me. He was going to Finley playing football. And he's like, hey, let me know how Kiwan's game goes. And I was like, oh, just live tweet it. Like, you can follow along. So I live tweet this Westland game. It was a pretty good game. Thomas Worthington won. Um, and I had a couple people that you know, tweeted at me. like, man, you should do that more often. Like, that was cool. You know, we were able to watch the game. So I went to another game they played, Olentangy Liberty. And, you know, Olentangy Liberty had just won a district title the year before. They were dominant. Westland beats them at home. So I'm like, whoa, this is fun. Like, I just witnessed an upset victory. Devin Williamson, he used to live in my neighborhood. Like, he had a big dunk in that game. And I kept doing that. And um, I ran into this guy, Darren Scarberry. I didn't really know him. He was filming some of those games. He had just graduated from Capitol doing uh, videography. He had been at Westland Games, Grove City Games, and I reached out to him, and I was like, hey, man, like, we should start a blog. I'm going to the same games you are. You know, I'm going to Ohio State. I'm studying communication. Uh, I've always wanted to be a sports writer. You know, I think that would be cool. You're putting the videos out. I can do articles. Um, so we started doing that and continued to cover Westland, and it really started picking up traction. Uh, the Westland students definitely embraced it. You know, I was sitting courtside, and I was way more biased towards Westland than I ever have been ever since as I've become more professional. But that was that first season was really fun. And once Westland was knocked out of the district tournament, that's when we kind of expanded. Uh, Darren and I covered Northland all the way. How to, old were you at this time? I was – so I would have been 20. Yeah, I just turned 21. Um, yeah, 20, just turned 21. No, that was 2000. I just turned 20, actually. So I was 20 years old. Uh, just, you know – this passion was created doing something you enjoy doing something I enjoyed and I I really had started you know following high school basketball when I was in high school um, because I was was the same year as Trey Burke you know the year uh, younger than Jared Sollinger so I loved watching those those Northland teams and you know through YouTube and highlight tapes Ty Kish who you know runs City League Hoops and now runs middle school hoops he was doing all like City League games back then so I was able to watch you know guys like Jerry Dixon from East uh, Dewan Magai from Marion Franklin and that's when that passion was kind of created back then and it was about 2010 and I kind of went away from it focused back on baseball I was focused on music doing you know other things so when this all occurred you know it kind of reinvigorated that passion I had for high school basketball especially the city league you know it's still like at my core like that's the basketball that really excites me um, that's surprising with the the fact that you went to Central Coast right that- City League is your thing because I mean that's one thing I wanted to ask you about stuff too because I mean I grew up in the City League played yeah. in the City League all that and uh, to see as much how much you cover the City League and it, I I won't say that the bias is really that you can see it in you but I mean I think that's kind of more so where a lot of your uh, basketball happens of yeah. course too in the city 
but I, I, it was surprising to me to see from you that how much I, you were into I loved the city it, man. It was actually, you know, you being a West guy. So once that 2012 13 season was over, I'll get into West. Just, I got to explain this. <laughs> oh, no, too. you so, come right ahead, man. Uh, I covered Northland. They lost in the state semifinals there, 28 0 coming into that game. They had a chance to become the first, uh, you know, Ohio team to go 30 0. They lose to, uh, it, was, it was Toledo Rogers, I believe. No, they lost to Minner. Toledo Rogers beat Wana Hills, and then Minner beat Toledo Rogers. But um, so Northland loses. So we're like, damn, like, I guess we're going to cover AAU now. So start covering AAU. And. I was covering these like four or five star guys. That was really fun. You know, I interviewed my first, episode, the first player I ever interviewed was D'Angelo Russell. Like, oh, man. in my entire <laughs> career, I was covering, you know, shout out to my guy, Corey Beasler. I was doing like text message interviews with him during the Westland season. And then two months later, I'm in, you know, Charlottesville, Virginia at the top 100 camp interviewing D'Angelo Russell because he had just committed to Ohio State. So I'm doing this <clears throat> and. Throughout July, we had traveled all over the place. I guess Darren's parents had like tons of frequent flyer miles. So we were, or not frequent flyer, well, they had a bunch of points. So we were able to go to all these hotels for free. So we just had to pay to drive to these places. So I was, that summer, I was Charlottesville. We went to Fort Wayne. I uh, went to Akron a few times, went to Louisville, went to Atlanta, went all the way down to Orlando. I was at all these tournaments covering these four star, five star guys that had big time offers. So then that summer, 2013, 24 7 sports they had like a kansas and georgetown site they both offered me you know jobs i was getting paid like 10 15 bucks an article to write about some of their prospects and it's july of 2013 i just watched d'angelo russell he lost to tyus jones and reed travis um and on d'angelo's team he had grace and allen he had theo pinson joel berry like all these high major guys just got done talking to thad mata about d'angelo russell i walk up the steps it's at the disney sports complex and Two kids from Columbus, Manny Powell from Gahanna, Chris Burke from Columbus South. They walk past me like, hey, Zach, like we just we just won our silver or bronze bracket championship. And they were pumped. And I had like this epiphany. And I'm like, like what? I'm down here covering these four or five star dudes who have offers from Duke and Kansas and Kentucky. They don't care who I am. They don't even know. They don't give a shit what I have to say when I have these guys from Columbus that probably could use the recognition they would definitely appreciate it because they're not getting it at home like why am i why am i wasting my time with these dudes who you know they're gonna go to kansas and duke they're gonna go to those schools regardless so i had that really epiphany right there where you know what i'm gonna cover central Ohio basketball like espn's covering these four star five star guys oh, I gotcha, gotcha. i'm gonna give them an experience that you know the elite prospects shouldn't be the only ones to get that type of recognition Guys in, you know, Columbus, guys in Dublin, Westerville, and Tangy, like, if they can play, they deserve that type of recognition. So it was right then that I decided, you know, I don't need to cover those guys. I'm going to make a name with Central Ohio basketball, with these players, and I don't have to ride coattails of big-time players to get my name out there, to get my work out there. Because for me, it's never been about me or my ego or, you know, trying to prop myself up. Because if I wanted to make money off kids, like, I could have – gone to a pay model and ripped parents off for the last five years i'm still working full time you know i make my money at my day job i still make a little bit of money on the side with the basketball stuff but i just wanted to provide a vehicle to help these kids out and circling back to west that next 13 14 season i'd heard a lot about charles holland wanted i just i'm like i need to see this kid so i go and watch them in the city league preview that year they played whetstone he was incredible, but it was only half of a game. It's a scrimmage. I go to his first game at Hamilton Township. They're on the road. West wins. He has like 30 points. And I go talk to him. I get in the locker room. I talk to Coach McCoy. And I was like, hey, Charles, what's going on? Like, you know, do you want to play college basketball? He's like, oh, you know, I would love to have that opportunity. I was like, is anyone recruiting you? He's like, no. I'm like, you're, you're telling me that the dude who led the area in scoring as a junior and senior, when you had guys like Jack Gibbs, Jay Sean Tate, Javon Bess, you know, Jordan Dardis guys who had went on and, you know, played mid, high major, even some guys in the pros, you're telling me this guy has no looks at all. So that, that also kind of, you know, fueled me and was like, man, I got to, like these kids, if they can play, they, they deserve to be yeah, recruited. Yeah, and he was a monster so, at football too, right? He's a mon yeah, well, yeah. he's a Tiffin. So he broke the Tiffin just this past week. He's their all-time leader in receptions now. Yeah. He beat Nate Washington, held that record, who played in the NFL for a long time. Man. And Charles is a redshirt senior there. He missed last year with an injury. 
But he was a big time basketball player. He could have played Division One basketball too, and Division One football. Um, but he's a tiff, and he's gonna have a shot to make it to the NFL now. But a kid like that was having zero basketball recruiting interest. And after that, I had all these junior colleges like hit me up, like, "Man, who's this kid?" Like we saw your Instagram clips, because he had no tape anywhere either. So uh, those beginning, you know, type stages, those beginning experiences, helping kids out, discovering kids, and you know, putting them in a better position with recruiting. That's really what has fueled me ever since. And I always, you know, think back to those first couple years, like, yeah, this is where it came from, you know, like, so the problem, I don't mean problems, but like little issues I run into with, you know, maybe complaining parents or, you know, people trying to come at me. I'm like, man, it's, I know at my core what it's all about. So I don't really take anything personally for me but yeah, it I mean what it, so. they, they come at you trying to tell you that somebody should get more exposure more or exposure should... or they tell me I'm biased or you gotcha. know I'm trying to profit off kids or yeah so I'm like yeah that's not what it is so I don't take it personally but yeah I always tell people man in any situation where somebody's trying to attack you consider the source man and sometimes yeah. it's at I mean sometimes that may be hard to do when you don't know the parent that's coming to you exactly but at the same time I mean sometimes you can get a good idea in the first couple minutes talking to them of what kind of person they are or what kind of vibe they're giving off exactly. for sure. Um, but yeah, man, I, I, all of that and everything that you said, I mean, it, it, like I said, it hits so clo- close to home for me because I love basketball, played in the city, have seen a lot of good players come through the city, teams I've played on, pl- played against, everything like that. And, it, and that was a common theme back in the day for players to not get the attention that they yep. deserve. I mean, it was, I mean, hardcore, like, uh, I remember having a conversation, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I didn't know all the details, or maybe necessarily how many of, of how much of the information I was getting was uh, completely accurate. But for instance, my sophomore year, uh, which would have been my brother's senior year, which was 02, uh, the star player for West was uh, Tehran Wembley. Yep. And yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with him. But I did. I've done a ton of research. So gotcha, gotcha. It's spelled Tehran like the capital of. Uh... Yeah, I ran, yeah, so, but, yeah. <laughs> but Tehran was an animal, man, animal, and the games were ridiculous. I mean, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was like it was like something from a movie or something. Yeah. Going to some of those games because the games were so hype, and and he would just, it was like it was almost automatic that he was going to ball out, man, and and put up close to thirty or over thirty. Right. The better the competition was, which was one of my favorite things about watching him in the biggest games, he did the most. Yep. So, I mean, that's something you, of course, love to see. Charles was the same way. I mean, I, I remember watching, uh, you know, West hosted one at Ridge, and they went to the city championship that year. They had, you know, several scholarship athletes, and Charles had 38 that game. Mm-hmm. And with, like, three minutes left, he had West within, like, two or three points. So, Charles was the same way. I mean, they played his senior year. They played in the first round at Pickerington Central. Uh, Tate was hurt back then, but they still had, you know, they still had Jalen Tate, who's at Northern Kentucky now. Uh, Rodney Culver, who went and played at Ohio um, in 14. That might have been Parker Stewart, who's at Pitt. He was even a freshman then. But, you know, Charles was the best player on the floor in that game too. So um, I know exactly what you're talking about. You you love seeing that, man. You love seeing that. But uh, what I was getting at there is that with all that being said, there was a a lot of people talking because I would start having a conversation with some people saying like, man, where's he looking at or who's offering this and that? And granted, with a lot of people in the city league, there was always issues with what's their grades like, right. whether their test score is going to be right, like this and that, whatever. But at the same time, I just had person after person after person telling me that from what they were hearing, there was nobody doing helping with recruiting. And yep. there was nobody sending tape out for him or, or doing things along that nature. Now, may, maybe, like I said, was I getting all the accurate information all, and all the details? Maybe not. But, I mean, I heard it pretty consistently, and it definitely seemed like that was kind of the consensus of what was going on all around the city back then and for a long time in uh, the city league in Columbus. I mean, there were certain teams, and at times when they went through their stretches, different uh, schools that had a, a nice run, right. that pe- they would get more attention. And yeah, you got to make it far in the tournament. So For sure. And West, and that's something that we always have struggled. So struggled, for sure. That's one thing that when I first started, you know, I wanted to give these kids an outlet where, you know, it's not just – who's going division one because in a lot of parts of the state still to this day, if you're not going D one, like a lot of those D two D three, you know, NAI level guys, they get kind of swept under the rug. They get lost in the shuffle here in central Ohio. Um, just this past year in the 2018 class, there's more than 80 kids who are playing some type of college basketball right now from that class awesome, or, or went to maybe prep school and um, have, you know, have a fifth year type opportunity. 
I'm not gonna take credit for all that because the kids obviously went out and earned it. But we've at least written about or you know covered all of those kids at least once. Um, and I know a lot of coaches. You know, I hear from coaches all the time. You know, and that's not just Division One. You know, sure Xavier calls me or Michigan calls me, Ohio State calls me, but you know, I hear from the Urbanas really frequently. I hear from. Um, you know, Wilberforce's schools like Owens Community College, you know, just schools all across different types of levels, you know, Capital, Otterbein. Um, at our fall league this past year, we had close to 45 different colleges that came out over five weeks total. Uh, and those are, I mean, Division One schools aren't allowed to come out. So we're having D2, D3, NAI, JUCO level coaches seeing these kids. And um, I just, I love having the ability, because if I just think back to where I was in high school, watching these city league tapes, and if someone would have said, hey, in eight or nine years from now, like, you're going to be, like, the source for high school basketball information, Central Hobby, like, no, you're crazy. Right, like, right, man. There's no way. That's uh, a, yeah, I can't imagine, man. I can't imagine how good that feels. It feels good. There's obviously a lot of responsibility with for it. For sure. Um, but I, you know, I take it as a blessing, you know, yeah. having this platform. Um, and I try to, you know, I've seen a lot of people that when they start making some money off something, that's really becomes their main motivation. Um I'm trying and i am done a pretty good job at it of not making that my number one priority with it. Um, uh, you know, that just this past Tuesday, I hosted an open gym at Cleo Dumery. Um, and I had, you know, 55 kids who showed up and about 35, 40 of those kids didn't play in any of my stuff this past fall. So and I even had kids like there's two groups from Whitehall. They got there at six o'clock and I didn't get there till seven thirty just to get on. So I want to continue to do stuff like that and, you know, reach different parts of the city that may not, whether it's financially or, um, you know, maybe our stuff is too far away. It's not only Tangy Orange, you know, bring something to them where they can still have a chance to play, you know, in front of 270 hoops and get that recognition and eventually take part in that brotherhood and the stuff we're trying to build, you know, with our events. So definitely, man. I mean, that was a, a, a big reason why, like, even back when I was in school, that I was always upset that we didn't have a, a gym on this side of town that was similar to like the hoop or yeah. something like that for people to play and uh, get attention a lot more the uh, leagues to go on because for a while I even thought about like man if I ever kind of get to the point where I want to invest in something or I make a little bit of money or something I'd really like to open up a gym on the west side yeah because it's been something that's been lacking for as long as I can remember there's just the kids they don't have as many as much opportunity man even yeah. if you you can go down to the youth level like there's not enough rec leagues out here right. I remember coming up like I played in the southwest basketball association I played in the Westland basketball rec leagues, you know, as as a younger kid. Those things aren't even out there for these kids anymore. So that's crazy. And they're still at a disadvantage. I mean, I, I went to Central Crossing High School and I had two kids from Southwestern City Schools in my fall league. Like, and I even had an open league where anyone could sign up. So yeah, I still want to be able to reach out and branch out to those kids. So I'm thinking my next open gym, I might do it a big run. Gotcha. And try and get as many West Side kids because it's free. Anyone can yeah, come. Yeah, so. I mean, I think that's a great thing that you could do. And that would I, I don't see why it wouldn't help to bring in a few more kids that maybe just didn't have the transportation or, exactly. or couldn't talk a parent or somebody into taking them that far. Right. But, I mean, that's that's something I would love to see, man. And, and any way I can help and stuff. So I'm dead serious about it. Let me know, man. Let yep. me know if I can help a little bit in any kind of way. But uh, that's, I mean, I'm dead serious when I say that. That was something I, that was always on my mind of why – isn't there something like that out here? And then also the fact that realizing that how that does influence the competition level yeah. and, and how much the kids around here are dedicating time to basketball because I feel like a lot of times the West Side has been lacking in the uh, – in the talent level coming out because of – Are they going – they say they still live here and they go somewhere else. Exactly, exactly. I'll just – I mean, I'll go with this. So in my fall league um, – so the championship team, they were down six points with 30 seconds left. And these, uh, they had two guys who hit shots to tie it up. One kid was Callie Davis, who goes after Centric. Callie played, I'm, I don't want to put his, obviously, his address and stuff right, out there. Right, right. He played in my Balfour City in my fall league. So when they register online, they got to put you know, their address where they live. Callie's a West Side kid. Like he lives over by Bishop Reedy. He hits the three, cuts it to three. And then uh, the other team misses a one and one. Talik Walker, who's Thurman Walker's son, he comes down, buries a three. Thurman's a West Side guy. Yeah, no you Thurman. Talik's a West Side kid. Talik goes to Pick Central. So, uh, talent like that, like Keon Magwood at Walnut Ridge, like he's a West Side kid as well. Uh, Jaquan Harrison, who played at Afrocentric, he's a West Side kid. Azende Johnson, who played at Walnut Ridge, like he's a West Side kid. So, 
still with those problems. It's sad, man. There's, there's just talent here. They just don't go to yeah, the Yeah, and schools. I guess that's what I was trying to get into saying, yeah. and I, I kind of said it in the wrong way, but I'm not saying as far as the talent, right. but I, there, I definitely see that they a lot of them move or go to different yeah. schools, and then kind of what I was saying is more so, I guess I, it is the talent a little bit also that not your superstars or not saying that there's not superstars or people that are really good, but uh, it doesn't seem like we have the quantity yeah, absolutely. As well on the west side, that the east side, north side. I think people get south discouraged. side maybe is a little bit low as well too at times for yeah. sure. But uh, I think that may just because they. I mean, south side is kind of just a weird area of town. Right. It's different, populated, different, and all that. But um, it just yeah, it it seemed like the opportunity of having more places to play and more leagues and things like that going on on the east side yeah. all through the time I was coming up even up till now seems like it has created more of a basketball environment Absolutely. and it has uh, put those kids in better positions to be in the gym the parents more. move their kids out there because they think that's where the opportunity exactly. is exactly um, and you know I, I can see that obviously the majority of the talent is you know on the northeast corridor of the city um, but still I put out a post yesterday with Kean Frederick and Antonio Gibbons who are both west side kids that Kean went to Franklin Heights he was also you know, that same year I was covering Charles, I was going to Franklin Heights games because they had this, you know, six foot six, six foot seven post who was a senior, played JV as a junior, had no type of recruiting interest. I remember back then, like Otterbein was the only school watching him. He's at Kent State now. You know, I, he I helped him in his pursuit to get to junior college at Owens, had some problems at Owens, and then he was, you know, strong enough and uh, had enough willpower to, you know, get back, you know, in the right swing of things and went to St. Clair, played two great seasons there he's at Kent State now Antonio similar situation um, West High kid had you know his fair share of problems back in high school but you know kind of stuck to the straight and narrow and helped him get to junior college and now he's at Kent you know as a red shirt junior there so those are guys who came from the west side you know their route wasn't directly to division one they, right. came, they came out of high school neither one of them had any type of division one recruiting interest um, both of them had minimal junior college interest too, come out of high school so I think for any kid, it doesn't matter where you live, you know, if you work hard and you dedicate every day to it and do the right things, it doesn't matter, you know, where you go to high school. Because a lot with a lot of college coaches, it, it's almost more impressive when you do big stuff at a place that it's not expected. Right, right, right. Because they wonder uh, what that kid would have done or how much better they would play with the right talent, with the, with yeah. the right talent around them, the right instruction from coaching, the right workouts, the right everything. Yeah. yeah. So oh, it, it makes perfect sense. It creates almost more intrigue and some of those kids are viewed with even more upside because it's like, man, he's doing all this without all those resources. Like if we put him in a program like ours and surround him with the players that we have, like who knows how we could elevate. So that's, that's a big thing. I think a lot of parents miss that when, you know, they move their kids to the popular suburban school that, you know, is putting out all the talent is if, you know, maybe if you stay at your local school and put up big numbers, it may do more for you. Um, you know, a kid like Von Cameron Davis, who's at Walnut Ridge, like, Sure, he could probably go to a Pickerington school or maybe a Dublin school or a Westerville school, but he stayed at Ridge and, you know, he had 43 points as a senior or as a sophomore um, at Briggs last year and tied the school record. So for him doing that, it almost stands out more when he's doing it, you know, at his school. It doesn't have to go anywhere else. And um, it's tough, man. It's tough when you're a parent. I, I yeah. mean, I, I'm a parent of a toddler, so I mean, I, I only know a, a small amount, but I can imagine the driving force a lot of times is not wanting to have regret, man. Yep. Not wanting to have regret that you could have put them in a better situation. Exactly. You could have gotten them a little bit better coaching. You could have had them in a better school that was more geared toward that train of thought so that they didn't get caught up in other things right. and, and caught up in the life of growing up in the neighborhoods and stuff around here. So, I mean, that it's 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 a weird situation because I yeah. can't blame them too much. You can't. You know no, what you I mean? can't. Because you definitely want to do whatever you can to – to give them that boost and put them in the right positions. and at the, But at the same time, I see your side of it too. And that's something that maybe even uh, people here in this will get to understand a little bit more. Maybe if you say, can play, they'll find you. Like At least in Central Ohio, like, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure anyone who's worth their salt has a chance to be seen. But you know, if you're good enough, like people will find you. I mean, Coach K went all the way to Alaska to find Carlos Boozer. So. Right, right, right. Didn't, uh, what's the name come from Alaska too? Mario uh, Chalmers. 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 Yeah, yeah. He's yeah from I Anchorage. Mean, yeah, I mean, if those guys can do there it. There was this kid. There's this kid um, playing at Texas. He's a freshman this year. I don't know why I know this. He went to. He was from Barrow, Alaska, which is on the Arctic Ocean. It's the most northern city in North America. He was from there, but he's a six foot ten wing forward who could handle the ball. He's at Texas now. So, if coaches can go to the ends of the earth, of the earth, like oh yeah, and I, they'll I, drive to the east side. To right, right, for like. sure. <laughs> and 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 I can't. I mean, I would imagine on top of that, 
there's got to be a lot of coaches that want to be the one that finds the diamond oh, yeah. in the rough, man, or wants to be the guy that. It's a competition finds... with media now too. I, I yeah. have that drive too. Like, damn, I need to go watch this kid. Right, right. Because right. even like just this past Tuesday, there's this kid um, named Khalil Kamara who is from uh, Philadelphia. Just oh yeah, moved I saw a post to Westland, and I yeah. I looked a little bit at his stuff, and I was like, man, he went viral. This looks like an athletic kid. He man. went viral last week. He dunked on some kid like after lunch. Bleacher Report picked it up, posted it. It's doing viral. Like he became overnight, you know, people are like, Whoa, is that Wesson? Like, who is that kid? So I followed him and he DM'd me and was like, Hey, you know, does 270 have any events coming up? Like, I know about you guys. And I was like, Damn, my fall league just ended. I really don't have anything. So I was like, I'm just going to do an open gym. Just come on Tuesday. So he came on Tuesday and, you know, put on a show. But for a kid like that, um, I forgot my train of thought. I mean, how was he looking all around, though? Why I can jump in there. I mean, how was he looking all around? The, the like total package of his game he's definitely athletic you know the tape didn't lie there um, he's got a lot of natural ability as far as getting to the rim you know other parts of his game he's a sophomore so he's going to continue to refine that time to develop um, but I think if he can stay at Wesson it's I guess going back to that point if you do you know big stuff at a place that's not expected like if he can you know make Wesson basketball relative and again I think that would be more than you know maybe winning a district title at a powerhouse or you know maybe you know I don't even know but if he can go to Westland and stay there and, you know, put up big numbers, which I think he has definitely the upside to do. That is going to definitely mean something. It's kind of crazy too. Cause I put out, you know, the, the post of him doing the windmill dunk and jumping over somebody. And, uh, I had so many people message me like, Hey, how good is that kid? Is he legit? You know, is he going to make Westland good? Mm-hmm. So his name's out there now and people know about him. Um, that's man, that's the, uh, the power of social media. You gotta love it, man. That that's, that's something that I'm sure is helpful in you guys there. Oh, for sure. I mean, I came up like Twitter is half 75% of the reason why I have the follow, you know, the platform I do is because I grew that following on Twitter. A lot um, of people go there for information like crazy. I mean, yeah, who's in information? But these kids now are on Instagram. So I've had mm-hmm. to like reinvent myself and yeah. really learn how to use Instagram again. Um, but Twitter, you know, that's where all the college coaches have found me and probably have around a thousand, you know, coaches or programs following me on Twitter now. So, um, don't take it for granted for sure. I don't, I don't harp on these kids for, you know, being into social media. Cause I'm on Twitter like all day long. Oh so. yeah, man. I mean, uh, I, I came up around. Yeah, so. man. I listened to, uh, something talking about that today, man. I, uh, I listened to a lot of Gary V. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with him, yeah. motivational guy or whatever. Uh, and I feel like I bring him up all the time, but it's just cause I love a lot of what he puts out, but he was talking a little bit about that. And he was, uh, it was funny. He even made the comment of saying like, People say, uh, uh, get out, get outside and play like we did when we were kids and this and that, or like, uh, your parents, your grandparents did or whatever the case is. And he's like, man, unless you're 80, 90 years old, he said, let's all be honest. He said, Nintendo and all these other video games and the internet uh, has been around for quite a while. Long now. Time. He was like, so stop thinking that, uh, we're just always going to say that all oh, back in my day, we, back in my we, day. we were out and about all the man, time. I used to play NCAA football for hours oh yeah like. and see and, and i think too uh something that he kind of got into man is the same thing that i know and that i've told people it, it's it's about the kid and the parenting and yeah. the influence and stuff like that because i had days where i stayed inside playing right. playstation for hours <laughs> on end you know what i mean but at the same time i had a ton of days where i was out playing ball from the time i woke up in the, the lights morning came on until, at least in my yeah. neighborhood man lights yeah. came on i had to be home yeah but. all no same for me man i think that's a that's a common theme and people that kind of had that uh solid parent structure it's like Absolutely. Hey, if not at least you better be calling or telling us where we're at and you better be with a friend or see that's uh, see now or... like a lot of the guys in basketball you know older guys are like man the kids know nothing about the playground where you had to win and stay on you know now in aau like there's always another game so my open gym on tuesday i had 10 teams but it was one court so yeah. this was different for some of those kids they're like damn like i gotta wait that long for like, yeah you do so don't lose <laughs> yeah yeah oh and i love that man i love them getting that because that is one error one area or one uh, topic that I do kind of side with the people that yeah. say they're not a big fan of the ninth place trophies and the right. uh, and the just uh, participation, participation trophies type. and all that type of thing. I, and I've had this conversation multiple times in the past few days with a friend of mine at work, and it's because I do see that as a downfall, man. Yeah. I even see it like I told him I don't I don't feel any kind of like uh, dwelling on it or sadness or anything like that that it did go on for me or right. for kids in my era. But at the same time, I realized that in a way it's like a crutch and it's and it's not maybe the best idea because you want people to get their motivation and stuff a lot of times 
from seeing that they need to work harder right. to be rewarded or right. to win or to be at a certain level of competition. And I, I was trying to explain to somebody that's like, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the person that maybe a kid or somebody that's out there half the games that just paid to play on the team and this and that or just went to the school or whatever right. and just did enough to not get kicked off the team but then gets a trophy at the end of the year yeah. and stuff like that. And it's like, I always did, don't get me wrong, I grew up in the era that probably started it or maybe a little bit for me. Every team got a trophy when every, I was coming up. Every I mean. team, every every player got a trophy with, with me as well. And I and I look back at it now like, yeah, I don't see why that's necessary. Maybe I your shirt. I averaged three points a game. I yeah, didn't maybe your coach. shirt or your medal <laughs> or your something. You mean something. And I, I, I'm I even weary of saying that because I'm like, it's still like, with a yeah, medal so, or this and that, still some type of reward. But I, I think that that drive to make people want to up their game, man, because of losing, because of not getting that trophy and and seeing and having to watch someone else get it or watch someone else go on and you got to sit and wait 10 games. Exactly. And, so it creates that desire. And that's one thing I'm, I'm really proud about with the events we run to is we try to, you know, provide enough incentive for it to be competitive. So – you know, in our fall league in the two championship games that we had, both came down to the wire. Like, both came down to the last possession. Um, and, you know, most of the – I had a school, Division two school all the way from Naples, Florida, came up, Florida Southern, and the coach was like, man, this is like the best fall league I've ever seen. He's like, you know, the ones I've been to, it's lazy. The kids are walking up and down the court. He's like, this one felt like a real game. So um, that's one thing I've always wanted to do. So with our leagues – you know, we have the live coverage, we have the videos, and if you don't play well, you don't have a shot to even get on the highlight video at the end of the week. You don't have a shot to you may, maybe be in the write-up at the end of the week. So we try to create those incentives, and then it also plays a big part in the rankings that we do too. You know, obviously the rankings are never perfect, but I do use, um, you know, those chances to evaluate kids, and they definitely take that serious. Um, for a kid like Morgan Safford who from Bishop Hartley, he was our MVP of our league. He averaged, you know, 22 points per game. His semifinal game in the tournament, he went up against at the time who was the number one wing guard in his class, and Morgan like took that matchup personally and won that matchup. And you know he he was the MVP of our league, and I was like, you know what, I got to put him at the top of his spot in his position. And that was really that's what he told me. He's like, man, I, you had to put me on the at the top of those rankings. Like I was trying to be in third. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. yeah. I mean, that's the, the dog you yeah. want to see in somebody, man. That's, Especially in a, a player that I like it, seeing that as opposed to kids just crying about their ranking, like. Okay, I, I may be wrong, but just like if you prove me wrong, I'll respect it and I won't be all in my pride. Like I'll move you up, I'll admit that I'm wrong. There was a kid, um, actually two kids from Beechcroft this past year, Tion and uh, and Theron Jennings. They're both twin brothers. Uh, Tion, when he was a sophomore, had him ranked really low, like 85th overall in the class. And he tweeted at me like, "Man, these rankings suck. Like I'm gonna show you something." I was like, "All right." I was like, "Do it," and you know, I'll move you up and he really improved to the point where he was like the glue guy and they won the city championship. They won a district championship this past season. And he ended up being like number six at his position, you know, moved past like 15 guys that I used to have higher than him. So seeing things like that, like I'll admit I'm wrong. Like that kid proved me wrong. Um, but even maybe you didn't prove you wrong in a way. I mean, proved you wrong eventually, but that's something I was going to say as soon as you said it. I mean, that's something maybe, maybe you're already reminding yeah. yourself, but I definitely think you should is that when you're doing that, you might be lighting that the spark that, that and that fire, fire right. on, in a kid that is going to push them to work the way they they need to and the way that they should to get to where they want to go or to be ranked the where, where they think they should be. Right. So I it, I don't see a negative and and I know it's don't get me wrong this is me from man. the outside not, not rankings, getting the flack that you get. So. Rankings great they're great for page views but man people get mad. Oh I can't. I don't even like when I change them they? I don't. Why wouldn't they? When I when I update them, I don't post it. I just update the rankings. You can go find them. Like you can see they update. Oh, like, oh, damn, I dropped five spots. <laughs> but I used to back then, like two years ago, I, I'd make a big thing like, oh, we're releasing our 2020 rankings today, and kids would get. I'd just go like they wouldn't Attack mention mode. me, but I'm like, oh, that's definitely about me. Like, man, this is stupid. Like he's sleeping on me, and I'm like, yeah. okay, he's talking about me. So, um, so I don't go as much public with it, but the rankings. The main purpose for them is so college coaches kind of have a database. I even have them broken down by position now. It's point guards, wing guards, wing forwards, power forwards, and centers, and then even commitments too. So I'm able to track how many guys in the class have gone and what level they've gone to. Um, but that's the main reason for it all. I try to get as many kids into the rankings as possible so there's just a huge database. 
And it'll be funny, like there'll be like junior colleges late in the process, and they'll just send me a screenshot of my rankings, like, hey, are these what are these four guys doing? And we need a big. And then that's like, oh, okay, so they are using this stuff. That has to be so cool to see, man. It has to be so cool. I mean, that has to make you feel good too, just to see like that they hold that much weight and value yeah. in, in what you're doing, man. I mean, just for you to show me before the podcast stuff that uh, coach texting you and things yeah. like that. Like to me, that's. That lights me up just just seeing that for you, man, and thinking about it because I'm like that it's, has to be an amazing experience. It, it's really fun. I mean, I, I like being first with a lot of the news too, and it's kind of crazy how that all of it has changed. So Javon Best, who plays at uh, St. Louis now, he's a redshirt senior. He started at Michigan State, went to Gahanna. I covered him that 2014 summer or 2013 summer quite a bit, and back then it's just totally changed with the way the kids announce their commitments and their offers and stuff. But he committed to Michigan State, and he just sent me a DM like, hey, I just committed to Michigan State. So then I like tweeted it out. Nowadays, like kids are getting videos done, and they have all these elaborate plans to announce their commitments. So I find myself subscribing to a lot of teenagers' tweets. So when they do post that offer, I know about it, and then I can update my site. But just to see these, the way these kids are kind of branded themselves, too, is pretty cool. Um, you know, a guy like Sean Jones, like we talked about earlier, you know, he's got 12, 15,000 Instagram followers and that's just from posting his clips, you know, every time he goes to training, every time he goes to an event, his mom's always filming. So kids are definitely taking that entrepreneurial role and branding themselves and putting themselves out there too. And when I first started, that was one thing I was big with kids. I'm like, Hey, if you're going to be on Twitter, one, don't be stupid with your Twitter account. I know I was 16, 15 once I was an idiot too. So I'm glad Twitter wasn't as big when I was a teenager. There'd be some pretty bad tweets that'd be out there. But uh, I was also, you know, make sure your name is in your account. So if a coach is looking for you, he can find you. Unless you got something to hide, then definitely have like a burner account. But, right, right, right. Um, that's one thing. And I've seen that a lot with kids. You know, if I'm looking to try and find someone on Twitter, it's usually pretty easy to find nowadays because everyone's on there. So um, just to see the way the whole industry has changed as yeah, far as I'm, social media. I'm glad that you do that or that you remind kids of that because, I mean, we even talked about it a little bit with uh, Derek in the last podcast. He was saying uh, when he went to his uh, workout with, uh, I think it was the Rams, Yeah. Um, he said they brought up to him just stuff that he wouldn't expect. They brought up speed and tickets and, yeah. and that he has children already and this and that. And it's like, and he was talking about like basically just how it kind of slapped him, him in the face to notice – how much they're paying attention to and the details and small things that they care about. And that he was saying how they kind of approached him saying, I can go find a thousand kids like you, yeah. but you also have this that they might not. And I'm taking more of a risk with you. It's not. So, I mean, just letting them know that doing you the best give not these to schools do those things. So many reasons why they should recruit you and not as many shouldn't. reasons why they shouldn't. Um, and that's one thing I still got to remind kids like it. Hey, like there was one kid from South High School. He posted something just like ragging on his coach. His coach, like I know this guy, I'm real tight with him. Does a lot for the kids, and I sent a message like, "Hey man, you you should probably delete that. Like it makes it questions your character a little bit. Like I understand you may be frustrated with how things are going. I was like, but coaches like they value his opinion. If they see that, they're gonna write you off because they're like, oh well, he's not coachable. We don't want him in our program. So I try to do that even on a personal level. You know, a lot of people talk the game like oh the kids need to do this and then they won't actually take that step so anytime I see a kid that may be out of line I try to kind of take them under my wing a little bit and um, give them some advice without you know putting them on blast or right right exposing how does that them. work as far as uh how much contact you're allowed to have on them or what I mean are, are you free because I'm free so I'm not I'm, I'm not with the institution I, as long as I don't give them like money and free stuff I'm good right. to go so I have quite a bit of contact. It's not anything creepy. You know, some of these college coaches can get real um, personal with it, but I try to I try to make it casual with all these guys, try to relate to them on their level. You know, I'm not super old, you know, compared to them. I maybe am now you know, with what they listen to and the things they like, but, um, you know, I try to relate to them on a level where they think I'm someone that they can trust and someone they can go to um, for advice and different things like that. So I try to keep it personal on that side and, you know, not only am I someone who can give them professional help, but someone that they can come to and, you know, if they need any type of advice or help with something, I can, you know, be there for them too. So I try to, you know, always open myself up to that as well. That's great, man. I mean, it's just something that I was totally blind to of knowing what, if you did have any restrictions of what you, you know what I mean, could and couldn't do or talk to who or, or what, because I, I don't, I don't know how that whole side of things work. Yeah. Of course, you know what I mean? It's, I've been the middleman for a lot of stuff, even you know, I won't mention the schools, but 
even kids in college, like college coaches would reach out to me like, Hey man, is that guy thinking of transferring? Like, can you poke around and see him? Like, oh, I can, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to tell a kid what school is inquiring about you. So, um, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm in the middle there between, you know, that almost an agent for these kids with the college coaches and then talking to the kids about college and talking to the colleges about the kids. So kind of being in the middle, it's, it's pretty fun, but I wear a lot of different hats as far as who I'm talking to and, um, you know, the, the type of conversation and what's being discussed. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I can't say it enough how, how much I like that man and how much, uh, I think it's great that you get to do all those different angles and, and, and try to help the kids in so many different ways. Cause now, I mean, with the stuff even that I'm hearing from you now that I didn't know and you giving them advice and stuff like that, I, that's something, uh, somebody like me, Joe Schmo just wouldn't know from yeah. seeing your social media or your website or whatever you do. And that's, and that's, there's a lot of stuff I don't publicize, man. I, I probably could, but I don't. Again, I don't want to just pat myself on the back. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, and I, I did yeah, this good yeah. thing. And I don't like, feel like you are now, man. I don't feel like you are now, and I don't feel like you should feel like that. And uh, I mean, even as far as to go with um, you talking about uh, the money making off of yeah. it, or you haven't you you haven't made that your driving force, or you haven't went uh, dove deep into trying to make that what you're yeah. about. And so, I I don't even think. I think in a way, yeah, that's that's definitely the right way to go about things because it seems that with almost anyone that I've come across that becomes successful in something, it's because they're doing it for the right reasons and because of right. a passion that makes you work harder and makes exactly. you do the go the right way about it. And in turn, people see that and provide you with opportunity. Right. The money will come. I the mean, money will come for if you're sure. Good enough. And I think for you, I I, I think it's on the way, man. I think yeah. it's, I think it's coming for you in a big way. And I think that what you're doing is all the right things. And uh, even just with the little bit that I know about you and uh, all that. All that being said and all that, I mean, I don't think you should feel any type of uh, shame or, or, or doubt in, in the way that you go about things or even that if you start to look at, hey, maybe we need to make some more money here or charge more for this or whatever way that those angles yeah. are, I don't know the details of. But the main thing is, I, as you probably know and as a lot of people know, money also provides you opportunity. Absolutely. You know what I mean? To do more things or to kind of Yeah, maybe, so with the events, I mean, as a business, like we have – more expendable income than we've ever had so we're able to do more events because you know we don't we can pay for the gym fee that we need we can pay for the refs every single week so it definitely opens you up to way more possibilities but i'm also making more money in my you know day-to-day -day job so i can go out of pocket like this open gym on tuesday i just paid out of pocket and i'm like it's 70 dollars. like that's okay right um where is uh if you don't mind me asking i mean where is some of the sources of income uh, specifically, or what is maybe some of your main drivers in so the 270, 270 hoops, hoops so, that brings in money? So we get paid uh, monthly off Google AdWords pretty much from our website. So, you know, in high month, high traffic months during the season, you know, we're getting 250 to 300,000 page views per month. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get probably 500 to $1,000 off that. And then off the, you know, the events that we run, you know, obviously we got to pay for everything. So we make a little bit off the events and then we just put that back into the business so we can pay for more stuff to be innovative and, uh, you know, get camera equipment. So we have more guys who are able to film, have money to pay staff so I can get more riders out to more games this year so we can cover more stuff. So a lot of it just funnels back into the company. You know, we're not writing like Jason and I aren't just signing off big checks and, you know, going to Italy and vacationing. Like, right, right, right. I'm still, you know, waking up at seven thirty, seven 7 o'clock going to work every day. Um, but it's definitely, it's nice to have a little bit of side income where I can kind of relax a little more, but, um, you know, we, we make, we're not making money hand over fist and we don't approach any of these events with, Oh, how can I make the most money? What event can I do to make the most money? Um, I, I partner with Andreas James of Nova village athletic club. He used to be a division two head coach at Tiffin. He played at Tiffin. He's got, you know, him and I have the same type of motivations and same type of, you know, just, um, same type of inspiration when it comes to running these events where we see holes in the area, we see voids that can be filled and then we create events to fill those voids. We see needs in the area. That's what we do. And then, you know, if the money comes cool, if it doesn't, we're still providing kids with, you know, something different. I want to provide a different experience um, with me running, you know, the events that I do. I covered events for so long. I saw, man, I hate the way this is run. So for me, I can fix that. I can run my own stuff and, do it in a manner that maybe wasn't being done before. So it's just the beginning. There's so many more things that we want Man, to do. Man, it sounds like it. And in the things you're saying, I feel like you're saying all the right things too. Even, I mean, and I'm not saying that from anywhere, a place right. of experience, but it's just that, uh, just to compare it to other 
avenues and other routes that people are successful in business or just their passion or whatever. The, the, not only to mention the things we already talked about, about you doing it for the right reasons and this and that, but also to have the wherewithal to know that you're going at things to find those holes and yeah. to try to fix those. That's problems. innovation, man. You yeah, can't man. do I mean, the you're, same you're crap talk, that everyone's doing. Yeah, you're doing. talking like an inventor or like a, like a straight up entrepreneur that even though you're not about, you're not, your goal isn't just money, money, money or right. this and that. It's your, your, your target is the right things. It sounds like for sure. And I, uh, I just, I want to create stuff that is not easy to duplicate or stuff that can't be duplicated um, with our fall league. And that sets you apart. Yeah. If our fall league, like every, so everything is on our site, every game's covered. All the stats are in there. Every kid has his own profile page. Every team has a page. Um, every game's documented. So, you know, I had parents that they track all their kids' points, and I got a, like an email like, "Hey, my son had five more points than you gave him, and we diligently track that not stuff." Twenty-two. But no, it was like he had he had nine and not four. I was like, "Okay, I'll fix it for you." So, it means something. And then when we have the video coverage to go along with it, I just want to create a product that you know is not easy to duplicate, and you know something that kids really enjoy. So when they know there's cameras in the building, they know that every game counts and that the points are being tracked. Like. It creates a little more motivation for them. Yeah, and I think honestly, it, it's going to make the right kids step up and stuff yeah. as well oh, yeah. too. Because it, I mean, that's something that I always thought about. That I felt like uh, even with me, I not that I had some crazy potential to be some right. star or anything uh, to begin with, but I always noticed that like um, bigger situations kind of frightened me of yeah. going through it because I I, want, I wasn't in it enough. Right. So like I played too much street ball as opposed to not playing enough in AU right. and. And enough organized and stuff that those situations at times felt awkward to me or right. felt foreign because I wasn't doing it when enough. Exposed to it, right? So. And I see that now that uh, I want to tell whoever I can that hey, make sure whatever your your goal is, that's the avenue or the thing that you're really getting the most well, exposure. One thing I most... tell a lot of kids is, you know, if you're at a gym and you're the best player in the gym, you should go find another gym. Time to go to another gym for unless, sure. Unless that's, you're that's great like advice. LeBron James or something, but right, right, right. Um, there's not and there's not many of those for right. sure. That's one one thing I really like about our fall leagues too is, especially in the so, in a lot of our events, the majority of our events is invite only stuff. So I'm able to you know put the teams together and balance them out, and you know every team when I when I plan it all, I got three ball handlers, three wing players, two big men. Brad Stevens says basketball anymore is ball handlers, wing players, and big men. So I try to balance that out. I get kids from all over the place. You know I have a kid from. You know, Marion Franklin playing with a dude from Taze Valley and playing with a dude from Olentangy and playing with a dude from Harvest Prep. So for those guys, they're playing with guys they're not accustomed to. They're playing against people they're not accustomed to. For the small town guys, you know, I, I'm real tight with uh, C.J. Anthony, Harvest Prep, his dad, uh, Chris Sr. And, you know, he's like, I tell T's, he's like, I tell C.J. all the time, like, it's going to be better than those, you know, mid-state league games you're playing in, you know, all summer long or all you know, winter long. So take this serious and CJ is a competitor and you know for a lot of those small town kids like it's the most competition they're going to get all year and one good thing about it for the college coaches too is you know when you're evaluating somebody if you know a kid's really blown it up you got to wonder okay is this kid that good or is a talent he's playing against that bad for sure it makes perfect sense so I, I try to give the coaches a ver very good eval where they're playing defense the games are competitive they're tightly officiated um and then the kid is, you know, showing his full potential and going against equal talent or maybe even better talent where that coach can be like, okay, well, you know, he just went up against a guy who's committed to a mid-major or a guy who's got Division two offers. Like, okay, he held his own, then he must be that level. He's a guy we can recruit. So all those things factor in my mind when I'm crafting these events to make it worthwhile for the parents, worthwhile for the kids, worthwhile for the media, worthwhile for the officials who are officiating these games because they don't want to officiate bad basketball. They want good games. And then ultimately the college coaches because they're the ones who are offering the scholarships and providing some more opportunity for these kids going on. Um, and, you know, back to my core, like I was the first person in my family to graduate from a four-year school. I didn't – I'd never seen anyone ever graduate. So when I started Ohio State, it was really overwhelming. I'm like – there's no way I'm going to graduate. Like, mm -hmm. like my dad was only at OU for a year, got too tough. I've seen other family members who did it for maybe a year, year and a half, and they just found their way out. They dropped out, didn't finish. So seeing how my life changed when I was in college and being around people who were smarter than me, being around people who were more successful than me, that were more creative than me, it just drove me to better myself. And I think one thing about college is 
when you get around those prof- you get around those professors who are professionals who have been in the fields that you want to be at. You know, my favorite professor in college, like she used to cover the Philadelphia 76ers and the Philadelphia, she was like, was tight with Allen Iverson back in the early 2000s. Man. That was someone I'm like, man, I can learn so much from this person. For sure. Um, so it taught me to be a professional. So when I was starting off, like, I'm like, damn, I want these kids to, you know, have an opportunity to have those experiences, uh, be in those environments and be in positions where they're going to be challenged and um, it's going to ultimately make them a better person. So I think even if a kid's at a school for a week, like when you're on college campus for even a week, like it does something to you. You know, yeah. you, you oh. come back home and you, you see different. Like, you know, man, I don't want to be around this. Like, Yeah, and it's crazy. I mean, that's something that I've talked a lot of, with uh, different people about lately too. I mean, exposure at of all different levels, but definitely uh, college, I, it always – I always wondered because I never attended college yeah. what uh, someone like you or someone that has attended or graduated really felt. And it's 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 really interesting to me to hear you say that was the impact and that was what it gave you. But my, even like my college experience was different, man. Because I, to this day, I feel like I didn't have the real college experience. I commuted all four years. Mm, okay. I never lived on campus. I put myself through. I got all types of loans. I had to work, I had to work the whole time I was in school. So I, even if I think if I lived on campus at Ohio State, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing it right now because since I was a commuter, I was home all the time. I could Kept drive. Driving. I could drive to Briggs. I could drive to Northland. I could go to Upper Arlington for games because I didn't. I, if I lived on campus, I wouldn't have a car. Right, right, right. I'd be stuck on campus. I'd probably be working. You know, bartender job, working or, there or partying. That's why I said kind of working maybe there kept or partying. Out of the scene. Yeah, and then, so it but kept at the me same out time, of that. into the scene that you. Wanted, kind of wanted to be and in and should be in. In my college experience, I don't really talk about this a lot, but it, you know, maybe I held myself back professionally as far as my day to day job because I didn't really have any real internships. I didn't have any real, you know, marketing type experiences. I didn't have, I, I did strategic communication, which is mass media, marketing, advertising. I didn't do any internships in those fields. There's people that I was in class with that. They, you know, the parents could afford to send them to New York City to do an unpaid. I can't do that. Like, right. I got ten dollars on bank account. Like, some weeks I was eating McDonald's all five days because right. I could only go on the dollar menu. So, uh, there's ways that basketball it never held me back. But I remember, you know, I graduated 2015. I'm going to these interviews and they ask me, like, okay, well, we we understand that you know you have this basketball passion and you know it's a hobby. And I, I like I hate when they say it's a hobby. hobby. Like it's not just a <laughs> yeah. hobby. Um, they're like, is that something you'd be willing to give up? You know, if you were to work, I'm like, no. And they're like, okay, well, we're not interested. I'm like, okay, like that's fine. You got the wrong guy. Then. And I interned at the Columbus Chamber of Commerce in the summer of 2015, and there was a guy there who was the head of like uh, logistics there, and he brought me in his office. He's like, Zach, so what do you want to do? Like, what's your dream? And I was like, you know, for now, like, if I could just find a full time job where it's, you know, not super stressful and I can make a living and then continue to cover basketball and, you know, build this on the side. He's like, that'd be perfect. He just looked at me crazy. Like, he's like, so you just want a job that will just give you money enough to do this. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I, okay. Why are you here? And I'm like, definitely wasn't what they were expected to hear. I'm like, I don't know, man, being in corporate America, like, I don't know if you've ever been in corporate America, yeah, you get man, to your I, car and like, I just had an urge to like play bone thugs and harmony because I'm like, God, odd. my like personality, my, there's no culture here. It's yeah, ripping it's a, away it's an odd experience, from my man. soul. It's so. an odd experience for sure. It's weird that, especially, uh, I think in the age group that we're still in and that yeah. like, as you get, or cause it's like, it's so much of a, I guess it's so being fake. turned into a robot and, fake so and fake. worrying about HR issues uh, and this and that. I go to meetings now yeah. and I hope no one in my work's watching this, but <laughs> I go to meetings now and it's just so much fake laughter. Like yeah, yeah. that joke wasn't even funny. Like yeah, why are you yeah. so being in that environment and my job now I'm at Buckeye Nissan, like it's a it's a family environment that dudes there are really cool. So I, I really like being there. Um, but when I was at like the Columbus Chamber of Commerce, like that corporate America thing wasn't for me. And that I knew quickly and that was I was getting paid like twelve bucks an hour that summer. I'm like, this ain't for me. Like, I gotta, yeah, yeah. I gotta I mean, find something. I don't know what it's gonna be. Mm-hmm. It makes perfect sense, man. It's it's a big part of why I'm doing this now, and that uh, uh, my eyes and ears have kind of been open to a lot of different things. Is because with my job, there's definitely that side of it. Uh, the department of stuff that I chose to move to was to try to kind of avoid as much of that yeah. as possible because I saw how much it was like 
a weird environment. It drains you. It really drains you. Being fake plus babysitting plus this, and it's just like no, I'm. It ain't for me. Yep. It's, it isn't for me. I got into a position that I've, I've been lucky that's uh, pretty relaxed, and yep. I can kind of have free, open conversation with the guys around me, and and it's 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 been something that changed a lot for me. That's but, my current position now. I mean, I got a Ben Simmons and uh, Giannis on the Kumbo jerseys on my wall in my office right go. now. So there you go. I like it, and it's actually cool when I interviewed at Buckeye Nissan. Uh, the first guy I talked to was Alvin Poindexter, and uh, he just seemed like a dude that might like basketball. So I was like, yeah, I cover high school basketball. He's like, oh, I played at Briggs. I was like, oh, you know Tony Rice? Yeah, man, he was two years older than me. So then instantly, like, I drew a connection with this guy. Now that's one of my dudes. You know, he's at Georgesville Nissan. I was a GM now, but his son's a freshman. He played in my fall league. He played in my you know, intro event back in August. So I knew I had the job right there. I was like, oh, Alvin likes me. And then I talked to my GM, Steve. And his son was a junior at Canal Winchester back then, played basketball too. He's like, oh man, my son knows who you are. And so I was like, oh cool, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, good, good here. So it has to feel good. That was having that day-to-day support. And this is also something I, like people, a lot of people don't know that I have a full-time job. They think this is what I do all the time. Right, right, right. It's not, you know, eight more, 8.30 to 4.30 every day. I'm at Buckeye Nissan. I'm running the internet department. Um, you know, every time the leads come in, I'm the one addressing those leads, contacting those customers. Uh, that's what really, you know, supports me financially. Definitely does. You know, it keeps the lights on in my apartment, um, keeps my wife fed, and you know everything like that. So well, and I think that's the stuff that a lot of people need to hear, and something that I really wanted to provide to people. Yeah. I mean, that's why uh, I have you on. That's why I've had the other guests that I've had on, and because uh, it was weird at first when I first started doing this, I was thinking like I was gonna only bring on people that kind of had already completely transitioned to that. No, I like this. I like this format. Yeah, man, and uh, and it, it, it's weird that. Uh, kind of right off the bat i think josh has definitely done so he definitely did that he's got a book so he's yeah yeah he's pretty oh, he's, established. man he's doing big things man he's a he's an awesome guy that i grew up with he was in bat. his brother was big in basketball okay. you may have even uh came across some information stuff he was uh big at west his brother was uh jason waters okay heard which, that name. which was a big part of uh their uh city championship back to back to back runs and three stuff straight like. yeah it was, yeah it's, it's Going back and researching it now, I find it interesting that they didn't win with Michael Red, but then they won the three years after he graduated. Man, and this, like you talked about before, like we talked about in the state, man, in the state is and where until uh, until is South where the West kind of lacked, man. South won in 2017. The they won the city championship. They were the first, you know. I guess Avery Centric won in 05, but the OHSA doesn't count that. But you know, West West is still the last City League South team to win more than one consecutive City League championship. Oh, really? And that was 98, 99, 2000. Yes. So that's yes. how long it's been. Um, I'm a hoops historian. Like when I was at Ohio State, I had access to the Ohio, you know, public libraries. I could go back and find any newspaper article. So I spent like a solid like three months just reading old newspaper articles, educating myself on you know the legends, even guys that may not be known but were still killers. So like Teron Wembley, like I knew about that. I, I read about him. Um, a guy like Cyrus Smith at East High School. Mm-hmm. Um, Same era. Yep. Tyhon Johnson, who I'm pretty tight with now and is doing a lot of great things. Uh, just educating myself on those guys and just going back and doing the research. And I think that's really important. You got to know, you know, who came before you and what the, you know, what the industry that you're in was like before you. When I was big into hip hop, like, that's what all I listened to. I would go back 90s, 80s, you know, Lord Finesse and uh, Large Professor, like, just going back and educating myself so if i ever was to enter that you know industry i wasn't a novice or yeah man it seems like you're so much about the right way of going about it man and that's that's why i like even hearing all this stuff more because it sounds like those type of things are the things that probably have already set you apart yeah. but are going to continue to going forward i try to be well-rounded and i have a lot of just interesting interests you know I, man I'm, something that i pick up off you from pick up on you from the back and uh, your attention to detail yeah. and, and your memory. My memory so, is nuts. So the things that you're spouting out and, and years and names and yeah. things like that, I've always been someone who's really impressed by that. Maybe it's just me. I can go back thing. and name every Heisman Trophy winner from 1995. And that's, and that's, and first of all, it's amazing. Second of all, it's something that I think will benefit you and is probably already benefiting oh, sure. you in so many I mean, ways. Covering these kids like you know, if you're, in, you're in the, even more so. You're in a realm and in a, a, a business and everything where the names are constantly changing all the time. The faces are changing. Yeah, so it's not like you're somebody who covers NFL or covers even college or whatever. Granted, college is the same kind of amount of years as high school or whatever. Uh, but definitely the difference in you and someone who gets to cover pro who can just 
maybe 10, 15 years, they get right. to say some of the same guys' names and, and kind of bring up the same exactly. stats and this and that. So, but Yours is ever rotating. The test I do almost every year is I you know, write down all the schools and I'm like, can you name one player from every single school? At least one. And I'm usually, just, just give me a school right now. Just, just name a school. Whetstone. Whetstone High School. Um, a current player there. So Lamine Kamara just graduated. Okay, Whetstone. You actually put me on the spot. That's <laughs> a good one. It's funny because the only reason I kind of said that is because it's kind of, uh, uh, I think, a uh, uh, somewhat friend and uh, West High guy, Ike Jefferson. Ike Jefferson, okay. It made me think about West So, Sean, damn, you put me on the spot. Because is, is he coaching for Whetstone? Or, he was a JV White? coach last year. Okay, I wasn't for sure if it was Whetstone or Whitehall, but I was. He was at Whetstone. Um, they were actually a lot of seniors last year. Um so Sean Jones was a senior, not the same Sean Jones, but Sean Jones was a senior, Lamine Kamara was a senior, Jack Staggs was a year before that. Actually, that you might have stumped me there. I don't uh-oh, know. uh-oh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I'm trying to think here. Oh, man, that's understandable, man. I also wanted to say before I forgot about it too or whatever, uh, I didn't know, and it's and it's kind of bad, but I haven't had him on social media the whole time and stuff, but how long has Ike been there or been, and also do you know who's their head coach or? Uh... Yeah, so... Um, McLarenin, McLarenin, I think is his first name. Um, so my guy Richie Beard was actually their coach for like four years, and then he got the do- a job at Dublin Jerome this past year. Um, okay. So they hired a guy who was within the program. Um, he worked at the school at least. I don't know if he was on Richie's staff. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his last name. He's the varsity coach, and then Ike was the head uh, JV coach this past year. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And the assistant varsity guy. So they got some. Uh, they got a kid, Jaden Arledge, who is going to be a junior this year. He's about six foot six. Ike had him on JV um, for quite a bit last year. Definitely a varsity talent. Um, he played in my Battle for City event and was one of the better uh, 2020 bigs. So that's a guy I think they could lean on him going forward. And they had a kid, Gerard Reynolds, as well, in that 2019 class, who coming in as a freshman a few years ago, he was pretty highly regarded. Um, so if they can get him back on track, I think they'll have a shot to at least, you know, maybe be competitive there in the City League North, which. That 2018 class was deep, especially in the City League. Um, so it's going to be wide open. You know, Beechcroft had six seniors who all went on and playing college basketball somewhere. Man, I didn't know that. Jelani Rogers um, and Daytray Long, the two of those, there are like two of only five dudes in Beechcroft program history. Uh, score a thousand points. Jelani's at Youngstown State now, and then Daytray's playing at Urbana. So they had a squad, and then the City League North is. It's a little depleted this year, um, as far as you know, experience is concerned. So, I, you could see some schools like I think a school like Centennial could really surprise people this year. Um, last year was the first time in a long time that Northland didn't win the City League North title. Um, it was since 2014 when Brookhaven won it, but before that, it was back since 1994 was the last time that a school other than Northland or Brookhaven had won a City League North title. Man, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, for a long time, definitely around my era, Brookhaven dominated it. Brookhaven, it. And then, yeah. And then Northland for a while after that, for sure, I know. But uh, and it, I just bring up Ike and stuff and, and Whetstone and stuff as well, too, because him being a West guy and me knowing him, playing a little bit of ball with him and stuff like that, uh, I see him a few times a year for sure. And I, like I said, I've played in some leagues with him. And I hope he gets a chance to be the West head coach oh i do too day. man and I, he's a guy like that is gonna, he loves west man he loves west he loves west he lives he, he bleeds it man I, I love his hashtag west ain't for everybody yeah right? yeah yeah that's one of my favorite hashtags so um if he can ever you know get that job i think he could one keep kids in the neighborhood two bring back a prize so i think a lot of these schools you know you go to these schools that haven't been successful kids maybe not they don't know how good a school used to be yeah yeah, it blows my mind that there's nothing on the walls about West winning three straight. Oh yeah, city league titles in that gym. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, you got it, the big cowboy portrait, but you could at least put like banners or something in there to bring some pride. It just makes me think of so much of what I talked to you a little bit about before, and what I saw when I was there, and thought about afterwards of like things that are lacking, man, that would uh, make things better for their sports, for their their basketball players and teams specifically, and just. For the school, that better ways that they could be going about things. Pride, doing pride's things. the pride biggest for thing. Sure, man. I mean, and and like you said, to be able to boast that, to be able to say that, yeah, that's the last school to win consecutive city league titles from the south. Division. The crazy thing is that was my first. That was my first in person experience to high school basketball. Yeah. Was watching one of those teams. So for me, granted, it kind of, you know, I mean, probably spoiled me a little bit. But at the same time, it was kind of like I said before, it was kind of like a movie, man. Here's it was a fun crazy. fact for you. Um, 
So I believe in 2006, oh, it was 2006, West Senior Night. So Kyle Higgins would have been a Kyle senior Higgins, that year. Jake, Jake uh, Wickhiser, I grew up with him. And, West and beat Northland. Talk to him on a regular basis. West beat Northland. And that was the first, that was the last game up until this past year with uh, Brooke, or Beechcroft beat Northland. That a school in the City League that wasn't Brookhaven had beaten Northland. And it was West back in 2006. So that's that's how long it went. It was that's 12 crazy. years. And, the, and, the, and the, the West teams then weren't even very good. I think they had... I think that might have been either our first or second losing season. Oh five oh six. Because our last, our my year, I was 04, and I think I want to say we went five hundred or just above. But I think up until that point, it had always there were. I mean, we hadn't went forever and ha- since a losing season. Yeah. And I think even though Kyle and Jake were doing pretty well that uh, the record wasn't that great and they kind of started that's just, that's, I have all these fun facts in my head oh, stuff yeah, the research I've done and I just remember it like I write it down once and yeah. then it's like okay yeah. oh man is... it points more to what I was saying <laughs> about your memory and knowing the details but yeah I mean I, I got to uh, my brother started going to West in it would have been like the 98-99 uh, okay. season I think and uh, he starts hearing about how good the basketball team is and I think he I, yeah and he was playing freshman mm-hmm. ball and uh but I started going with him or just having uh, my dad bring me to the varsity games. Yep. And it was nuts, man. It was bananas that the, you couldn't get any more people in the gym. Like now it's, it was rocking. It's only packed if they're playing Briggs just because it's a neighborhood yeah, rivalry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that rivalry's always been big. I, Wes, there's just something special about that gym. I, it's You're not going to go to another gym History and eat anything it. like it. There's <laughs> literally nothing. But it's weird, man. It's a love-hate thing. My we great-grandpa were, graduated we were, there in 1948. Oh, same, same thing with my family. Man. I asked him. Or he was like, he's like, do they still have the dividers in the, the in the gym? I was like, yeah. What were those for? He's like, well, we used to. They used to divide girls and boys in gym class. Oh, okay. That's why those dividers that if you're sitting high in the stand, you literally can't see the other side of the court. That's why that stuff is there. So to see all that history, which is probably bad, because that gym floor needs to desperately need the whole school, that needs to be replaced. The man. whole school desperately needs a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I haven't been in there in a while, but it was like. Even I mean, for sure, when I went there, and I can't imagine from what I'm hearing, it's not much better, and a lot of things have gotten worse. But it's just old, man. It's, it's old, old, and they and they put they put minimal money into. Did you it. know the guy who designed West High School also designed Ohio Stadium? Same yes, dude. Yes, yep. yeah. It's it's something that like I forget often, but yeah. I came across one time. I don't know what I was reading about, man. And it may have just been one time when I was looking at some like West High alumni yeah. site or something, and they mentioned it. And I was like, man, that's pretty awesome. I mean, it's crazy. 1922. Yeah. yeah, 1922 when it was founded. Or a new school, at least, was built. Because it used to be Starling Middle School mm-hmm. was the original West High School. I'm a, a big-time West Side historian, too. Gotcha. It's actually my wife now. Our first date, uh, we are going to go to Milestone 229 downtown. Mm-hmm. And we get there. And I'd met her at a Ohio State football game the day before. I bought one ticket. She bought one ticket. We happened to be right next to each other. That's crazy. Zero mutual friends. A lot of similar interests. So we pull up to Milestone 229, and it was like closed for a private party. And I'm like, damn, like I had planned this. So off the top of my head, I was like, oh, let's go to Spaghetti Warehouse. It's just right across the river. She'd never heard of it, never been there. We go to Spaghetti Warehouse, and me being a nerd that I am, like I read and watch all types of history stuff, especially when it comes to West Columbus. And there's a West Columbus history book you can get at Barnes & Noble that really? I bought and oh, read okay. about. So it told me all about the history of the bottoms. Franklinton, as I like to call it, because... That's People from the bottoms, they get pissed when you say the bottoms. It's right. Franklinton. Well, and it's slowly, Franklinton's definitely slowly taking over that area. Now. Oh, East Franklinton, because mm-hmm. the gentrifiers are coming in. But um, So we're down there. We go to we go to Spaghetti Warehouse, and then I just take her all around. And I'm like, hey, do you know Gift Street was named Gift Street? Because when Lucas Sullivan founded this place, if you moved to Franklinton, you were given an acre of land as a gift on Gift Street. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's I would have That's why it's called Gift that. Street. And on Gift Street, the very first post office in Ohio is on that street. That's wild, man. There's, um, there's, I didn't even know that place. I always thought that was like downtown. That's oh, the, the original, uh, the and that's all that? the original West side. So yeah. It's just, it's just West of downtown. I mean, it's slightly yeah. kind of, it's south. turning into, it's turning into like the next short North because mm-hmm. the developers. So, the the land they were they were able to get it for cheap. And they then were in prime location. So close to everything. And, and with Franklinton, I mean, Franklinton was its own city up until like 1834. Like Franklinton and Columbus were two different cities. Oh, okay. So Franklinton was its own. They had their own government, their own That's you know, wild. police force. And Lucas Sullivan, 
his, the Sullivan Avenue, like he built all of that. And his brother-in-law was um, Starling, Don Starling, or not Don Starling, I forget his first name. That's why Starling, Starling Middle School is right? named that. Um, George Souter was something who also helps with Souter Avenue. Souter Avenue, yeah. Um, where Camp Chase is, is more Hilltop, where mm-hmm. Camp Chase is. One of the prime developers who, not developers, but one of the people who helped build that Camp Chase, you know, prison camp, his last name was Haig. Oh, That's okay. why it's Haig Avenue. Avenue. Gotcha. So reading these books, I'm like, oh my gosh, like that was Belvedere. Like that's why it's <laughs> called Belvedere. So um, reading all that stuff is just, I don't know. I, I love the West Side. My whole family's from the West Side. My grandpa grew up on, um, he grew up, he was, I think, Wayne Avenue, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, he served in World War II. Um, that was my great grandpa Ambrose on my mom's side. My great grandpa Bob, who's still alive on my dad's side, he grew up on the West Side, went to West High back in 48 and you know my great grandma she went to south high and they were like had kind of they've kind of been dating since they were in like fourth grade which to do that in the 40s like to still have contact with somebody who yeah. didn't like live with you like like how'd you that you didn't have cell phones yeah, or like, you definitely hear of people like uh from like 16 on but fourth grade on that's that's pretty rare yeah and that they've been married since they weren't snap they now. weren't snapchat no it was a snapchat <laughs> There was no slide in the DMs back then. Right, My right. grandpa was taking the trolley downtown to Parsons Avenue. So um, that's that's crazy to say. That. Uh, uh, both sides of my family are all West Side as well. Everybody West Side schools. West and High. Like, yeah. My dad. West High. My mom was the first graduating class from Briggs wow. when they opened up. Uh, but my dad, uh, my grandpa on my mom's side, a lot of family and stuff went to West and Briggs and all the local west side elementary schools middle schools uh, everywhere my i mean my yeah. my dad graduated from westland my mom was at westland originally and then she graduated from west it's just my whole family's come up on this side of town so i have a special just liking to it and we lived in westgate you know we my grand my grandma and grandpa they lived on the east side so we take 70 home and get off of central avenue and I just remember just driving down Sullivan as a kid, going to Don's Burgers and Fries, and my dad brought it because you could smell it. It was in that brown paper bag, and you know you're going to get some damn good French fries. There you go. So when that closed, like, I was, I was so sad. And then when I first got my license, you know, we lived out near Grove City, Southwest Columbus. Like, I just had this desire to I want to go home. Like, I want to go back where I grew up, where a lot of my personality was founded. And so I remember... <laughs> When I was in high school, like I was like, man, let's just drive down Sullivan Avenue, and they're like, why do you want to do that? Like, I'm not, like, it reminds me of being a kid. Like, I just, I, I want to be back there. And there's not a lot of good to get. There's no, there's the not. Side. But I, my family was like, why are you, why are you going down there? And like, I just, it's, it's a good feeling. That's that's awesome, man. I, I love hearing that too, just because uh, the, the West Side is close to me too, as well. And people and trash it, man. People like, trash it. Well, and and uh, a conversation I've had a lot with a few different people, but I've had with my wife a lot. My wife is West Side, family's West Side, uh, went to West as well. But she's one of the people that's still kind of like uh, weary to say or or be any kind of proud of the fact that she went to West and, yeah. and grew up on the West Side or is from the West Side or this and that. And I told her, like, once you get to a certain point, I think especially that maybe you feel, uh, you realize, she's someone that uh, she's never at any time going to realize uh, her success or realize right. what she's what she's accomplished or the person that she's became from the area she grew up in and stuff like that. But I've told her, like, to me, it's something that you can be proud of. Like, yeah. it's 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 not, it doesn't happen for everyone that no. comes from our areas and went to those schools and stuff that can actually make some of themselves and be a productive part of society and not be into trouble or drugs it's or for even to live and, and make it. It's good for the kids in those areas too. Cause they can be like, man, okay, this guy didn't have it all growing up. You know, for me, you know, my parent, my, yeah, sure. We live in the suburbs, but it still wasn't easy. Like my dad. So when I, my senior year of high school, my mom had a real bad back injury and she had to stop working and her social security benefits, I think of social security or whatever it was, had ran out after like six months. So my dad is already working full time at UPS. He picks up a part time job. I quit playing sports my senior year because my parents need help financially. So I'm working at O'Charlie's. Like as a 17 year old, I couldn't work more than like 25 hours a week. Once I turned 18, I'm getting there. I didn't have to work till four every day. I got there at like 11, and I was like, hey, can I wash dishes? Like, what can I do? Um, so I really vow. That's where I learned a lot of hard work and um, developed kind of this. I don't know if it's like a me against the world type mentality Mm -hmm. because I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to go to the food pantry because we don't have money to, you know, go to Kroger. We had to go to, 
you know, cheaper places or maybe go without for a while. So, you know, I think a lot of people also, you know, when you move out and they're like, Oh, you're living in Grove city now. Like you're not, it's, we still struggled, you know, yeah. oh. we moved out there and then it's like, shit, like our mortgage is way higher than it probably should be because we can't afford it right now. So for me, then going through that experience as a senior and then I go to Ohio state as a freshman and I'm around a lot of entitled privileged people. And I'm like, you guys have literally no, no idea, idea man. how easy you have it. I worked at the call center at Ohio state cushy, most easy job. Cause when I graduated high school, my dad, who's in management at UPS, he helped me get a job at the Rickenbacker UPS plant. And that was at 4 AM mm-hmm. and I'm on the air. I'm on, I'm on the um, runway unloading planes, taking boxes off the, the cans and then loading them into the trucks. I'm doing that every day, 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. I did that my whole like first half of freshman year of college. And I'm getting, you know, I'm getting to my 8 a.m. Spanish class after working for three hours, being maybe in the rain some days. And then there's these, you know, rich kids like, oh my God, I had to wake up so early today. And I'm like, you have literally no idea. Like I've been up since 3.30. Right, right, right. Because I have to. Otherwise, I don't have gas to drive here. Yeah, and, and I think about it, and think about that, and so many that we know, and kind of like what we discussed a little bit about, people that had it so much worse than us. Yeah. People no, that had yeah, it so much worse, worse than like, us. I'm like, I had a car. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was lucky enough to even have a car. Yeah. And even my situation, like, yeah, I, I worked hard, but I'm not going to act like I just started from the bottom because right. I didn't, because... So this is the way FAFSA it's, is. I felt like you're, you kind of... It, it sounds like you kind of grew up in a similar uh, fashion to what I did, where it's like, at times, things were... Really going, rough, right. Yeah, well, and at times, things were going well or decent or whatever, but at the same time, you were around and in and grew up and stuff like that, whatever, and had a little bit of your own experiences and your yeah. own family and stuff to where you, you see a little bit of both of it and you can, you can sit here and say, like, I kind of know what it's like to be down and stuff like that, but I didn't come from the bottom, exactly. as, which is something I don't claim to have either. And that there was a lot worse families, worse situations for other people, worse areas that they grew up in. And but it gives you perspective too. That's what I was going to say. And all that, that's what I'm saying is that just that little bit, the, I appreciate it. And that's why I see, even say the thing about like telling my wife about coming from West and this and that. It just, it just helps you all, it helps you appreciate and understand more like you, it's, I think it's so nice to get to that point where you yeah. can kind of appreciate it and see it. Even though, like I said, once again, we didn't come from the no. bottom or this and that. It's not like this crazy, we're millionaires now and we came from living in a trash can type right. thing. <laughs> but it's just even that little bit. There's always stuff you can be proud of and that you can show other people. Like you said, I think it's good for other people to hear it and especially kids and stuff that grow up in this area that they don't have to be ashamed of it so much, stuff like that. Just use it as motivation. Yep. Use it as motivation. That's my biggest motivation. I mean... When I first started in the basketball scene, um, you know, and other guys may complain, like, I don't want to go to that 8 a.m. AAU game. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm there. Like, shit, I used to wake up at 3.30 to go work at 4 a.m. Like, right, right. I would much rather watch Scal Labissiere and sit next to John Calipari 8 a.m. Because I was, I was working for 7.85 an hour. Like, it right. could be much worse. Um, I, I took the motivation from my dad because my dad – so when he worked, so he worked as a driver for the Columbus Dispatch newspapers at night, Thursday nights, Friday nights, Saturday nights. So this man would wake up for UPS at 4 a.m. on Thursday. He'd go to work from, I believe he worked like 5 to 5. He'd come home, sleep till 8 o'clock, and he'd drive UPS from like 9, or not UPS, but Columbus Dispatch from like 9 to 1 a.m. So he literally would go, or 9 to about 2 a.m., and then have to be back up for his 5 a.m. job so from like thursday to saturday like he really didn't sleep because we needed that like my mom was in a bad place back then and you know her medical bills were pretty high the medication was pretty expensive so to see that i'm like man this this basketball stuff is easy like my dad did much worse man like he was grinding yeah that perspective and motivation that gives you i i hear that so commonly in people that are successful or are on their on their way and on their track and I think it's going to be something that's going to be awesome because I think at the time that after you have kids and when they get to our age they're going to say the same thing about you man they're going to say my dad was going and working all day and then he'd leave and he was at this basketball game and then he go he went and did this and then he was up all night writing and then he would uh, be texting back and forth and be on the phone with coaches and this and that's something that it's gonna it's it's also something that I, I that's why I love talking getting people like you on putting that exposure out too because then in turn it's going to 
probably put a spark and and give great perspective to your children as well yeah. if you plan on having them and that type of thing. I mean, not I, not not for the next couple of years. Oh yeah, I, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to rush. <laughs> oh, no, I know, I know. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I, my mom and mother in law may be because they want grandchildren. Oh, I'm sure they will, man. Especially now that you're married. That's that's something. And, and don't get me wrong. It's it's one of the best things ever, man. If not the best thing ever, I, I say. Especially for somebody that. Uh, like I said, you seem to have a lot of the same interests and uh, family values and random things that I have. It's it's amazing to to go through the process and and just see them grow and and try to do what you can to right. put them on the right path. And and I think that's something else with what we we're talking about of like just growing up in the places we've come and we come from, and then trying to build that uh, that pride and different things like that. It's something that you can throw into your kids, man, to, as as much as you can that helps put them on the right track. But uh, it, it all brings me back to thinking about how much I love this for the West Side. I love what you're doing for the West Side, man. And and it's something that, like, I, I really do mean it when I say yeah. if there's if there's ways that I can help. And, I'll, and like, I don't have any major platform yet or, or this and I want to get I want to get West Side, Southwest Side kids more involved in our stuff, man. I, it's just there's not enough representation of some of these events I'm running. So I think, you know, this, is, this conversation has just motivated me to probably – I'm probably going to book the – big run open gym here in a week or so do it man do it man i'll go half with y'all i'll 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 pay for it one time or something and you can yep. throw it on something maybe we'll do it as like oh you say it's sponsored by aaron, the aaron wants to know podcast yep. and maybe people can get on here and listen to you and that's not even just a plug myself but it just so maybe they can get right. on here and really see and then see my uh, side that i don't see show. your side and and know that you're really you really do have these connections with so on Kyle. twitter i gotta be so professional right. i got but, so many followers i gotta yeah, be yeah kinda well and you should be corporate man. america you know which that. i should yeah, but. yeah. But I'm saying even so, just to see that you really do have these connections and you really, like, so that they know coming to your events, getting yeah. exposure to you and the people that you're in contact with or whatever is beneficial to them. Because Absolutely. I'm saying that literally as in I want to see it help them. You know what I mean? Right. I want to see it help the West Side. I want to see it help the city, the players from every side of town because that, to me, there's it, that's all upside, man. It's all upside. Yeah. I, I hope all I hope everything in, in that whole realm works out for the kids and, and gives them the best opportunity they can have. It's all about getting them to college, man. That's literally, it's always been the motivation. Um, when I was in college and studying African American history is my minor. So I studied a lot into, you know, the institutionalized racism in America, um, the barriers that existed in African American communities that really, you know, harpened those kids and, you know, people coming up in those areas from reaching their full potential. So, is interesting you know when i'm first starting this career it's you know 2013-14 season which that season it was my first full season covering the whole area that season so much to me because it's when i really got into it and my passion was born for helping those kids and you know disadvantaged kids and kids in um you know areas that maybe coaches or media didn't want to go to schools they didn't want to go to because you know preconceived notions or reputation so taking those classes and getting that education being exposed to what's really happening in America, what's really happened in America, also put this battery in my back where it's like, man, people, like a lot of people probably don't know a lot about me. You know, maybe parents or fans that may be more racist, like they see me as a white dude and they may think I'm more comfortable with the shit they want to talk about. Right. But it's like, no, you don't know like yeah. my thoughts on things. So that's a motivational factor for me as well to do right by the kids and also stand for the right things, you know, just as an American and as a, as a citizen, you know, anytime racism is going down, I'm, I'm going to speak out about it. I'm going to, you know, hold racists accountable. And that's one thing that is really important to me. And I've, I've even had, you know, a couple people like tweet at me like, Hey man, you should you, you calm down with that racism stuff. Like you're going to lose followers. I'm like, Okay, if I lose racist followers, it's fine. Like, oh, if you're about the right things, I didn't want forget, you following yeah, me in the right, first place. Exactly, so exactly, bye. Forget like, what they say. Go follow somebody else, and um, kind of pointing, staying along with uh, just the the concept of you know giving kids and disadvantaged kids a, an opportunity and a platform that they may not had before. Two Seventy Hoops was really born off of. So I was working at Prep Hoops, the Prep Hoops Network, which is a fairly uh, it's you know about five six years old the guys who run it are based out of minnesota they reached out to me and um they're like hey we want you to run our ohio site and this is after that 2013-14 season where that passion of covering the city league and the whole area was born and it was all free coverage you know at that land grant holy land where i was at for 13-14 prep hoops reaches out they're like well it's a, it's a subscription service 
Um, but not all the content will be paid. You know, we can, we can do about half and half. I was like, okay, this sounds pretty cool. Like this is my own thing. I can kind of build it. You know, it's a brand new site. I can kind of make it my own. And it's, you know, about five months in seasons, almost halfway over. And I had covered like three or four city league games in a single week because when, you know, after uh, Christmas break, the city league, they start league play like a week before the OCC does. The OCC doesn't start till about, you know, 10, 12 days into January city league. Like if it's January 4th, they're playing. If school's, if school's, Mm -hmm. you know, going on. And we had like this town hall meeting, um, with the two guys who, you know, run the company and they're like, yeah, we saw that you had gone to a couple, you know, inner city games in Columbus. They're like, yeah, we don't want you covering those games as much going forward because, you know, those parents are not subscribing to the website. And I was like, so how are we supposed to provide them with exposure? Like, well, you know, we'll help. We'll get them in other ways. We'll help them in other ways. And I'm like. Which is you'll really do nothing at all. Which is you'll do nothing. So right right then and there is my senior year of college. I'm like, man, one, these guys need me way more than I need them. Um, I built a, a core following that I knew would follow me no matter where I went because it was my word that counted. It didn't matter what the link was or where it went to. If I'm putting it out, they're going to read it. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to turn my back on these kids. I'm not going to say, oh, okay, well, your parents aren't subscribing, so I'm just going to go yeah, watch. you're not where the money's at, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna you go don't watch matter. Dublin Jerome and, you know, Lyndon McKinley. You, someone else can follow you. I'm, I wasn't going to do that because um, at that time, you know, a kid who was a senior there was Hassan Verence. Um, another guy, you know, there's some of these, like, hidden gems that I've, I'm really happy for it because I was one of the first people to follow them and to see them in college. Now, Hassan plays at Ohio Dominican. He's, uh, he'll be a redshirt junior this year. Helped lead them to um, a conference title last year. They made the NCAA tournament for the first time in a long time. Hassan was a senior at Linden that year. That was a kid that I was really trying to put on the radar. I made his first ever highlight tape. Uh, took him. I didn't take him on any visits, but I connected him with schools that it ended up recruiting him, and then Ohio Dominican eventually recruited him. What I didn't know about Hassan is he had 16 siblings. He was the first person in his family to go to college. He was Whoa. the oldest of the 16. Imagine what, what he's doing now, what that would do to his brothers and sisters. Like, mm-hmm. big brother is in college. That's what we got to do. So for those guys to say that to me was like, okay, then like, you don't get it. Either yeah. that or you're just you're motivated by money only where you're like, well, we just need the subscriptions. Where you kind of, you may be undermine or undervalue what a lot of these kids and families are going through. And, you know, the subscription was a hundred dollars a year and these guys were acting like, well, that's it's a hundred dollars, man. That's like less than $10 a month. I'm they like, have no idea what that is. When somebody, you're struggling yeah. to put food on the table, like paying for a basketball website is, that is trivial. So out of the question. It's, it's trivial, man. Like, it's so out of the question for, for a lot of parents to even consider that a lot of people to even consider that. So that's when I got with my buddy Jason Morrow, who's the co-founder of 270 Hoops. He was working at Future 150, which is also a subscription-based website. He was trying to do free coverage, and they weren't too keen on that, and that didn't work out for him. And I was like, dude, let's just do something together. I was like, I have the idea. He's like, well, what are, you gonna, what are we going to call it, like Central Ohio Hoops or Columbus Hoops? I was like, 270 Hoops. He's like, huh? Oh, I love the name. I was like, 270 Hoops. I was like, what does everyone who lives in this area, the outer belt is 270. Everyone knows it. No matter what side of town. And, even, like, that, and even some of the outskirts. and stuff Back like then, that, I was like, Google it. I was like, Google it. Nothing's going to come up. I said, if we launch this, we're going to be number one on Google. And the SEO, our search engine optimization is going to be great because there's nothing else like it. I think if we're Central Ohio Hoops, if you Google that, the dispatch is going to pop up. This Week News is going to pop up. It's going to take a long time for us to get to the top of Google. If we want to really take this, we got to own you know google and the search engines so we did it and i actually designed i thought of this logo i was like we'll just put a a basketball on the zero boom there's a logo i love it i love it too and the kids just man like the the area when we came out with it because i was working at prep hoops that was my only job as a senior i was getting paid like 20 bucks an article i was like so i'll just stay here i'm gonna keep going to these city league games or you're not gonna fire me because you need someone in columbus and then ever since i left they still haven't found anybody in columbus Hmm to work for them but um so i stayed doing that and once i got hired i was at tansky salmo toyota originally once they offered me a full-time job i was like okay we can do this like i'm making enough money in my full-time job where i don't need to provide for myself with basketball articles that can be a side thing um so we launched it november 15th 2015 it was actually funny i started my full-time job at tansky 
the same exact time that our site went live. So oh, as you okay. can imagine, that was probably very nerve wracking. Oh yeah, that had to be a... Uh, so I'm like trying to like ease into this new position and I got this, I'm like trying to explain to the my coworkers, I'm like, yeah, I, I got this website launching and they're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I'm like, no. like Back to that hobby thing. We're talking, oh yeah, that's cool. Hot that's hot. really cool. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I hope it goes well for you. And I'm like, well, no, there's a lot of people like waiting on this. Um, <laughs> But to be able to provide that, you know, the, the core basis behind 270 Hoops, as far as the content, the content is concerned, is to have something for free that parents can enjoy, um, the coaches can enjoy, players can enjoy. You know, I've had a lot of players that say, man, I, when I get home on Friday nights, like that's the first thing. Saturday mornings, I'm refreshing that. I'm, I want to see what games are in there, who scored what, who did what. Um, that was the core basis. You know, I, I hate the subscription model. I hate you know, getting information from a kid and then slapping it behind a paywall and making them pay for it. That's just so ingenuine to me. Um, and I, I really struggled with charging for anything for a long time because it was never about money. And I had to kind of come to the realization that, you know, I'm providing something like it, it deserves to be paid for, paid for in some way or for another. Sure. And sometimes it, uh, it establishes you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It establishes you as, as letting, people pay for it. Then it means people, something. Yes. Letting I mean, people know that it's serious. Letting but I'm not, know. I, I'm never going to have a subscription only website where you got to pay to be a part of it. It is about the community. Um, you know, my late friend, Marshawn McCarroll, who I was real tight with, we did music together a lot, um, back in the 2011, 2012 era. Um, I knew him back from, you know, Finland middle school when I was in seventh and eighth grade. Um, Marshawn's biggest thing was, you know, in order to, you got to build community to, to move community. So if you, if you want to move your community, you want to make changes, you got to build that community first so that people can be in a position where you can move them, you can influence them. And that's what I'm really trying to do with this basketball, um, with 270 Hoops, is have these events. It creates community. It brings these kids together, people together from all over the area where it's 270. Like, it's this is about us. This is fun. It's a pride thing. Um, and it just it brings a lot of just different demographics together, you know, with the great game of basketball and – it's it's more than any other you know part of the state you know columbus and i think we have a lot to do with it uh, it's just a brotherhood down here i mean these these kids they're all friends you know they they compete but they also have a lot of love for each other and i try to put them on a platform where you know they can all be celebrated at the same time so that's why i think the 270 thing is so dope man and it's so it's it's it was such a good way for you to go on all angles is because like you said, everybody can relate. So say you would have started it and it was City League Hoops or say yeah. it was uh, OCC this or whatever. And you and just put yourself in a box at that You put point. yourself in a box and then you have other kids that maybe look at like, oh, that's not for me or that's not right. a snare. I don't want to wear that shirt or do this. The 270 Hoops, I feel like a lot of people, especially someone from outside the city, may not realize how ingenious that is and how yeah. much that involves Everything in Columbus and the surrounding areas the surrounding because areas. everyone uses two. You have to use it to get anywhere in this get area. Anywhere. Anyone who lives in Central Ohio lives within a certain distance of that and is aware of it. And and it's almost it's a it's really like the it's like the border of the city of Columbus. Oh, for sure too. it is. I mean, for sure it is. That's what a lot of people related to. Like everything inside the city, people consider it's Columbus. It. Inside if you live outside of two seventy, you ain't from Columbus. And that's right, one thing. Right. It's kind of off topic, but. You probably relate to this being f from the city of Columbus. Like, I hate when people who've never had a Columbus address say they're from Columbus. Like, it's okay to be from Dublin. Like, yeah, yeah. Say I you're mean, from Dublin. You know. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't have. It such, makes me mad. I don't. Yeah. Know. No. 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 I get it. I get it. No. I don't get so. Uh, I don't have the the same kind of thing about. It, but I definitely get what you're saying because yeah. you do have people that almost look at it like a, a clout chasing thing or something love like, oh yeah, I'm from Columbus or this and that. Whatever. Man, if your taxes don't go to Columbus City Schools, you know, you're from Columbus. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Like I live. Okay, sure. Where I, I live in Northwest Columbus, I'm like sandwiched between Upper Arlington and Dublin. But damn it, if I had kids, they'd go to Centennial. So right. I'm like, if you've never had a Columbus address, I get it, man. You, I get you, it. It's okay to be from the suburbs. No, oh yeah, that. for sure. And I for lived, sure. I lived in sure. I had a Grove City address for like 12 but, years. But, but the thing you got to think about, man, I think it's just like what I was saying about like with my wife or something like that. It's it's kind of that in reverse for your people that are in the suburbs. Yeah. They don't want to be looked at as soft or right. as they, no, they didn't experience enough or they. They're not tough or whatever the case is because they're from the suburbs. So they might just, and not to mention, I think as well, you have your people that just say Columbus because 
uh, someone from out of state, out yeah, of town, whatever, no just may not have any clue what Dublin is or this. That's like all, all the all the white girls at Ohio State. Like I'm from Cleveland. Like no, you're not. Like yeah, yeah. you're probably from Brunswick or yeah. Strongsville. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get what you're saying for sure, but it definitely. I think it's. It, everybody has their different reasonings and their yeah. different uh, things why and and there's probably some that like like I said just do it because of out of shame or whatever the case is or just who they grew up around because sometimes right. I see that too but or you're uh, ashamed yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. I mean yeah but I, I mean with with you doing the 270 thing and with the, how I think kids can be proud of it and 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 now that it's it's you have the impact that you have and so many people like want to be known on there and want to be ranked or and and, and to see kids go through the process too i mean so the 2016 class that was the fir- they were the seniors our first year we got those guys doing big things like seth towns is at harvard he's a junior now he was the ivy league player of the year he's played in my events before so it, it, i can show kids like look man seth was right here he was playing in the same stuff you're playing in he was playing against the same teams you're playing in he's got a chance to be drafted in the nba now um and you know, that 2016 class, once those guys start going pro, I think it's really going to take off then because right. there's going to be guys right. that I've covered that are now in the NBA. Yeah, it reminds me so much of the talk that I was just having with Derek about Hope Fitness Yeah, because he's getting right at that point too where he's going to get guys that are going headed towards the NFL. He's going to have plenty because he's got some animals in that. Oh, I'm sure he loves hearing that right now, man. Oh. And that and that's how I feel as well. But uh, I think you're. it looks like you're heading that same path yeah. and, 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 and it's only going to – lead to good things for you because even if it's just the fact that you can point that out even if it's just that right i mean that is awesome and something that people are going to want to be they're going to be drawn to your brand and, and, and what you're doing and things like that but uh it, it all reminds me of a question so give me a little bit more because i this is just for me to know and for yeah. the people that want that watch this for like a little bit of information on inside of like business or starting some up okay. so give me a little bit on like I've always wondered where, how this developed through the time. So from what I kind of had seen back in the day, and then once I uh, did a little bit of research on you with uh, your social media and things like that, it looked like you, um, to put together what you've already said about uh, live tweeting the game yeah. and, and things kind of sprawling from there. So you started writing articles about when, how long after that and how that come about. And- so, yeah, so I started writing articles back in 2010. when I So my buddy Jason, who's the co-founder, he already had a sports blog called Behind the Box Score when we were in high school. He's your order to me. And I was like, man, that's really cool. Like, so I messaged him, and that's how we became friends. I was like, hey, man, I, I, can I write for your blog? Like, I've always wanted to do sports writing. He's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. So it was 2009, and I was writing about, like, Reds and Indians and college football and kind of just diving into everything. Um, and then it got to a point, it's high school basketball time, and I wasn't playing because I was a baseball guy. And then back in 2010, 11, you know, I'm working a lot too. So every Friday night I had to work. I was at O'Charlie's mm. serving or being a bus boy, um, whatnot. But I started then Jerry Dixon, who is funny cause he played in the WCBL rec league this past season. That's a guy who was like the first dude I ever wrote about in Columbus. Okay. Jerry had, I believe he had 40 points. His first game of senior year at East high school, they played against Mifflin. He dropped like 40 or 44 or something like that. And I added him on Facebook, and I was like, hey, I write for a blog. Can I interview you about your game? He's like, yeah, sure. So I sent him some questions, and we've been you know, pretty cool ever since then. Um, so that's when I started. So doing articles in, but I wasn't at the games because I had no transportation. I couldn't get there. didn't have my license. Um, but when all this started up, the articles, so the tweets came first. That was for like a couple games you know, when I didn't even know if this was going to be something that even happened. Once I reached out to Darren – and we started um, Scarberry Media, is what it was called. His last name Scarberry. It was his own website that his dad, his dad had kind of built the company, and um, we took it to then another level. But the first article I'd ever written and game I covered with an article was January fifth, two thousand thirteen. It was Westland at Upper Arlington. Westland went in there and beat Upper Arlington. They haven't done it since. Um, I'm about to say that sounds kind of rare. Yeah, they they. <laughs> Whip, they whipped them up and down the floor, and then that, that next year, Upper Arlington went to the state finals and you know lost in the state title game. So that's when it started, and articles have been a critical thing. You know, every game I go to, I try to have a recap, um, and then I'll do recaps of you know the top scores that night. So it's the thing I do every Friday night, stars of the night, uh, gotcha. Friday's top scores, and even if it's games I haven't been to, I can still you know give hey. 
Ryan Wolf from Taze Valley had, you know, 35 points as they defeated Circleville, whatever, whatever. Um, so the, the content's always been a big thing. One thing that I've always been prideful of and one thing I've always consistently done is I go through all the box scores each night and I send out. So now we have scores and box scores on our website. So when I put the scores in, it spits out an automatic tweet from the 270 account and then I share that. So, you know, I'm going through all these games. You know, Justin Curtis of East had, you know, 28 points as they defeated Mifflin 78 to 62. Provide the link to that box score. Anyone who's reading it can click on that. You can see all the stats from the game, who did what. Um, I've always, that's something I've always done. And I picked up a lot of followers initially because I'm putting out the information. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense because that's exactly, I mean, kind of the coaches. Another question I kind of had just because uh, I've been somebody that I still have a decent amount of interest just in the, City League, especially uh, basketball and stuff like that, but I haven't followed it much because there, I always felt like there really wasn't an easy way yeah. for me to get the information. Stuff. But for you to say that, I mean, it makes me want to visit your site a lot more and check those things the coaches, out. Coaches, I mean, college coaches, my very first, so that coach, the text I showed you earlier, mm-hmm. like, hey, we just offered this kid, he came on a visit today. My first season, um, he came up to me first time I really talked to him. He's like, man, I love your Twitter account. He's like, I can go on there and I can find everything. He's That's like, awesome. if I see, you know, so-and-so had 35 points, he's like, I'm clicking on that. I want to see who this kid is. So where did you pick up a lot of this information of, of, or just, or were these a lot of this ideas or were you watching other people of to see like how to go about things or, or how or was it just kind of like, because it was your passion and the things that you wanted to see out there that you chose. That's to why I did there? it. So I wanted to put the information out there and I just, I love being able to, discover kids and you know post their accomplishments and when they're having big games and I've always had this you know hunger and kind of desire where I always feel like if I'm not working really hard like someone else is working harder than me and they're going to take my spot so when it comes to putting these Friday night scores and Saturday night scores two night scores like I'm a madman like no I I gotta get this out or like someone's gonna find this or post this before me um, and, you know, starting off early on, you know, I would just go to the dispatch because they post all the box scores. You know, the first couple of years, that's where I found everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, well, they're not posting it. So I'm just going to take their information and I'm going to post it. And then people are going to think I just found it. Right. So right the dispatch right. had, even to this day, they got, I mean, the, the, it's still the traditional place where the coaches just send their box scores. The dispatch has a staff. They post all this stuff. You can still, I'm still able to find a lot of scores, but then I do something with it and make that stuff easily accessible where you can find all the information, all the stats. Um, but now it's gotten to the point where a big, I'd say a pretty wide majority of coaches just send us stuff automatically now. And that's kind of cool because it's breaking the mold. And we, as a, just not a print magazine, not a print newspaper, we're online only. We've really legitimized ourselves in this area. And oh yeah. For you to talk about the amount of, of visits and stuff that the site gets, especially, I mean, I even, so I, I, I I like to be innovative. I like to do things no one has done. One thing that we've done the last couple of years, and I've created a system for this. I do a seating guide for division one. So when they're seating teams for the tournament, I put the, I, I do the spreadsheet all season long. I got my own power rankings. I even have a strength of record metric that I've created. So I do one through like 15 for the rankings. So if a team beats like a number one team or number two team on the road, that win is measured as like 100 points. Mm. And if so, if a school beats, if you have like eight wins against a team that's not very good or teams that aren't very good, those wins count for less. So there could be a team who's 10 and 12, but they didn't beat anybody. Their strength of records may be 40 or 50 points. You may have a team that's 7 and 13, but they beat like five good teams. Even they have less wins than that team, their strength of record is better. I go through and I track every single game, for every single team in Division One in this area, I spit out this um, strength of record, and then I assemble what I would see the area as for the district tournament. And it's different from what we used to see, like teams with the best record. You know, oh, they have 18 wins. We're going to move them up. Now we're seeing teams with 12 or 13 wins that have a tougher strength of record, tougher strength of schedule, be ranked ahead of those teams. And that's a, that's a seeding guide I put out. It's, I mean, it sounds like the way it should be. I put out Thursday, before, so they seed – they seed on Friday, Saturday of, you know, that whole weekend. I put out the seeding guide on Wednesday, Thursday every year. And this year I printed out mine. I got there. I looked at the actual seeds and it was damn near identical. You're unbelievable, man. You're unbelievable because your passion and your, uh, 
your knowledge for things like that and uh, the way that you're going about it. That's, to me, I, it, it, me sitting here listening to it just makes me think how this should be something that you are doing full time all yeah. the time. And I, I, I hope the, the more you do stuff, the more this is exposure for you too, that someone maybe even offers you something, it, whether or not you take it or not, right. and you just keep developing your own thing, or they want to get in. I've had offers and be, from people and, that want to, but they kind of want to take over the company. Right, like, right, nah, right, and, right. Well, and, and I think I think you'll get the right thing, man. Yeah. If, if if that is what you want or that is the thing that really, the right thing will come along. I want to do it full time, man. If I, if I could, I can't imagine what it'd be like if that's literally what I got to do all day long. How much it'd more It'd be like living your do. dream, right? I mean. Yeah. Because I still, you know, I, I work like, I got to take care of work. You know, I got to get all that stuff done and do what's right before I can even think about, you know, doing some basketball stuff or writing an article or maybe doing some research. Um, I take care of work. If I just had all day long to write articles, I could interview more kids. I could go to more open gyms. I could have more events. It, ugh, there's just so much. Uh, the the thing that's amazing now is that I, I from from seeing what you are doing first, and then now from hearing it from you, the amount that you're already doing is unbelievable, man. That's why I said you're unbelievable. It's because it's like the amount that you're doing, the work that you're putting in, the knowledge that you have, the 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 things that you've innovated, the the different details of things that you've added and, and picked up along the ways and stuff, it's, you're already doing a ton. Yeah. So I can't even imagine if you were, if you were doing it full time at the level. I would have would, high, so my next, my next challenge, next step is I want to do high school tournaments with high school teams. And I even have an idea I've thought of very similar to the Maui Invitational in College Basketball. Okay. Um, where, you know, maybe I get six or eight teams in Central Ohio and they play a tournament like that in you know maybe december that creates kind of like a tournament type feel and i could even put you know maybe a division two or division three team like a bishop hartley or a johnstown put them up against some division one talent in a tournament type setting so when they do get to the district tournament they've already played kind of those elimination style games against a quality opponent that's all the stuff i want man to do, that's man. another it's, avenue or another time where so much more yeah yeah that's another situation where you're doing the right things for other people and for these kids and for the teams and the schools and stuff that at the same time is what the people want to see yeah. and probably something that you would love to be a part of and see anyways. I too. want to create those matchups too. Yeah, One that's thing exactly I, what I'm oh, saying. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm the saying. The player matchups too. I, I even, I manipulate that stuff in my own events. I'm like, okay, I'm going to put the top two point guards there that I go. have ranked and you're going to play there against each other. And I, there's, I've had matchups too. So I used to, Victor Dandridge, who used to be part of the Northland program, uh, he ran Coach Vic's Open Gym in Central Ohio for a long time, and um, he passed it on to me. I did it for the final year that it was running, and I had Darius Baisley, who was supposed to go to Syracuse and then go to the G League. He's now just preparing for the NBA draft next year. I had him go up against Jerome Hunter, who's at Indiana. They were like 1-2 in the state. Darius came up from Cincinnati. Jerome was there. I put him on the main court, and they weren't guarding each other when the, when the game started. Uh. And I literally I stepped on the court. I was like, you see all these people? They're here to watch you two go up against each other. I said, guard each other. Just do it. Compete. And they went at it, and it was what the people wanted. So that's the type of stuff I want to do, to, to create those matchups and uh, you know, give the people something exciting and then have the kids challenge themselves. Because one thing I don't like is you know when guys are like scared of challenge and scared of uh, adversity, and they don't want to put themselves in a the position to you know maybe get exposed. So. Uh, I like creating the exposure opportunities and then also making sure it's competitive so everyone gets something good. Yeah, I mean, you saying that too, that was another moment where it gave me chills, man, just thinking about you stepping out there and saying that and then it just going down in the game, you know what I mean? And yeah. it really, things going that angle and stuff. Um, just, so just also quickly before we wrap up and stuff here, so with you writing the articles and doing those different things, did that lead to where things kind of snowballed or was it just like you explained it of just more you just continuing to hammer away at doing things on your own Twitter with your uh, friend with the, the uh, media company and the website and all that? I mean, did it progress the way that I'm thinking as far as like you writing and all that and, and, and people it's, picking up your articles? Everything happened organically. Okay. Um, it, it happened the way it should have been. I when I, when I was really like 2013, 14 is such an important era for me because, um, you know, that 2013 summer and fall, I was going to a ton of open gyms in the area, um, introducing myself to the coaches, introducing myself to the players. That was really important. And that, that it really set the, you know, kind of foundation for what has been developed now. And I, I still, I stick true to those principles. Every game I have a notebook 
with paper. I have my own little box scores and I keep the stats. I, I've done that the entire time. I probably don't need to do that anymore, but I still like keeping the stats because it keeps me honest. That's the way I started. And for me, that's what works. I love having stats instantly. Like I can look down and say, oh, Caleb Weston's got 43 points and 20 rebounds right now. I can tweet that out faster than anybody else because no, everyone else is waiting for the official box score after the game. I have that stuff right there in front of me. That's another thing, man. That's another thing where I just pick up how much you're on top of your shit, man. It really uh, every is. angle, man. I when I even when I run events, I stay awake at night because I'm thinking about contingency plans and about the tiniest things. Like, oh, do I have a stamp for the front gate? <laughs> okay, we need to get wristbands. Oh my god, I got to order those. And it's like 2 a.m. and my wife's like, just go to sleep. Like, you can't change any of that right now. So, but man, it being your passion is is exactly what. I feel like I love everybody hearing this and this is exactly why I think you're doing so well and, and, and things are going the route that they are is because it's making you meticulous about things. It's making you... I'm a madman. I'm like... So my first Battle for a City event and thank God for Andreas James because he takes a lot of the burden off of me with the events that we're doing now. But the first Battle for a City event I planned almost on my own and it was everything. Uh, just got to get the gym reserved. Um, got to make sure I hire police, got to make sure, oh, the kids got to sign waivers. If they're under 18, the parents need to sign it. All these things I'm on top of, oh, I got to make sure I get gym space so I can allow these guys to practice. They can play with their teams. Once Andreas came on board and he handled a lot of logistics for me on that side, it took a huge weight off my shoulders, but that's where it was born. Um, I'm just super organized. I love spreadsheets. Those are like Spreadsheets are my that's, favorite. That's man. what my guy Luis is here, man. And, and it's funny that you say, I mean, you're kind of saying something that brings me into talking about him at the same time. I feel like that's a key role too, or a key factor that a lot of people need to do when they're trying to create something is a lot of times you just need to bring on that other piece yeah. that is that has the things that you don't, or yeah. at least can, can can push you in the right direction or, or just do things differently sometimes too. But all that is so key. And I, I think that that's, that with the, the things you're talking about about hard work and the things you're talking about about doing things after hours and why I'm you're up, doing them and I'm doing, them, late, the, doing them for the right reasons on and on and on and on this all is things that I feel like are all the things that lead to something being successful and someone being successful man. Yeah. and I've got to put the work in man it's it's so cliche but literally like nothing works without work um, and that goes for all facets of life. Uh, it goes through athletics, through jobs, through relationships. Like you have to put in the work every single day. And when you do make it, you can't forget about what got you there, the things at the foundation, at your core. Um, and that's one thing in my relationship with my wife. You know, I still do the same things I did when I met her, you know, when I was able to pick her up. There like, you go. You got to still do that stuff. And, you know, she loves it and it, everyone's happy. So, um, uh, you're on the right track, man. You're on the right track. And and I love hearing it, too, from a guy that's a little bit younger than me, man, that you're uh, beyond your years, man, and it's paying off for you, it, it seems, at a lot of different avenues, man. And you being about the right things and doing all that is exactly what I want to hear. Uh, something I want to tell you before we wrap this up all the way and I have you plug all your uh, information and site and things like that is I'm dead serious when I tell you if there's anything I can do to help. I mean, even if it's like, hey, I need... And I'm saying like on a volunteer level yep. of just like, say you need some guy to help at this open gym. It's not, if I'm available, man, okay. I, I'll, I'll be there. We always, always need help, man. I'm uh, dead serious. I'm, I, I hope you take my word for it. Yeah, man. I'm no. dead serious and, I, and I'll help out and do what I can when I can. And uh, I, because I love what you're doing and I want better for our side of town, yep. for our city. And the fact that you're a hardcore on the west side is just it's the oh, best thing ever to man. me. Hopefully. Sullivan Avenue is my favorite road in the world. <laughs> I'm also pissed that it's down to freaking one lane on each side because that's I went to the Sullivan Avenue School of Driving, and if you're driving slow, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. It pisses me. I mean, it's actually funny. It, it might be part of my fault. So I used to go to Stu's Barbershop all the time on, on Sullivan right there by Oakley. And I was parked where it was right around Wayne, where it went down to one lane and there was that parking lane right mm -hmm. there in front of the barbershop and my car was there. This is the summer before my senior year and some dude is just flying down the street and he doesn't get over in time and slams into the back of my car and I'm mm -hmm. in the shop like mid haircut and they're like, damn bro, your shit just got hit and I'm like, fuck. Like I go out there, he hit my car so far from behind, it went under the car in front of me 
and came back down. So not only was my car totaled from the back, the hood was damaged even though it only got hit on the back side. All right. And I go outside and this guy's like, yeah, man, there was a damn school bus and it, it came in my lane. And I'm like, I'm like, it's, it's July and it's 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. Where in the world are you going to find a school bus? Man, you know how it goes, man. <laughs> a nice day. You saying July just makes me think it's a nice day. It's the hilltop. Somebody's just out there mobbing. Flying. And they're bo- trying to bob and, and weed Ever traffic. since then, where that parking lane starts by Wayne, where it comes down to one lane from Hague, and you're going towards downtown, it's one lane all the way now. So right. I feel like could be my fault. I don't know. It's probably not. But <laughs> nah, man. Nah, I just, I'm just i pissed that, that it's not two lanes on each side, man. Yeah. I used to, you could fly down Sullivan. So what I, I lived off Dimrist, uh, Alkire, Dimrist area mm-hmm. when I would drive to Ohio State. And 270, going, you're right by it when you go by 70, 270 to 70 to get downtown in the morning, it's always jam-packed. Right, right. So I would just take Sullivan all the way to 315, and I'd get to school. And I used, when it was two lanes, I could fly. I would get from my parents' house to 315, about 10 minutes. Oh, I know what you're saying, man. There's I never used, any traffic, when ever. I, when I used to live over on uh, Powell, man, I was going to work, working out by the airport. Yeah. There was literally a couple mornings I got to work it right in between eight to ten minutes at the next to the airport. Yeah. From over on the west side just because I would zoom up there, jump on the freeway and be and you're gone. right there. But yeah. So before we get out of here, man, give everybody all the the places where they can get some of the their best information from you, the website, where you're at on your different social medias, Instagram, Twitter, this, that, and and let them know where to go. Okay. So two seventy hoops dot com. Um, that's the website. You can find everything there. It is October now, so once we get, we're actually putting out an online magazine, preview magazine, that'll be available. Um, we're looking for sponsorships, any local businesses that might be listening to it. We're looking for sponsorships um, and ads all throughout that magazine. That's coming out, but 270hoops.com is the website. You can find everything there. You can follow me on Twitter, Zach Fleer 270 Instagram, Zach Fleer 270 and Facebook on 270hoops. Um, we got literally all the content is there. Our YouTube account, also 270hoops. You can find all the videos. We got highlight tapes from our fall league, highlight tapes from the intro event, and all types of stuff throughout the season as well. Um, and follow 270hoops on Instagram as well. Jason Morrow does a kick-ass job getting these videos out. Um, we have another kid, uh, Nathan Perky, who's 18 years old, big into Photoshop. We brought him along this past summer. He does his graphics are like next level. There you go. We're posting that stuff too. He's he's amazing. And I'll, on my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'll have more information on you know upcoming events, and you can find all of my articles. I post everything on there too. Some people can read it. So that's where you can find us. Um, you know, season gets started in November. We're gonna be everywhere. I probably cover 150 games per season um, at a game almost every night. You're sad. I'm a junkie, man. I'll go to like Horizon Science and East on a Monday just because I need to see East. And who knows, Horizon may have a player I don't know about. That's the way I approach everything. I want to see – I try to see every team in the area at least once. That way when I'm asked, if hey, name a player from Fairfield Christian, I can tell you, oh, they got Jared Rose. He's a talented freshman because I've seen these. I've I've ran events and done things to put everyone, no matter where you go to school, on some type of map. And if you're talented and you're worth it, you know we're going to try and do everything we can to put you in a position where you can be recruited. It definitely seems like it, man. You're an animal. And I, this was amazing, man. I'm, I'm so glad we did this. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I like this one, for sure. It's fun. And uh, going forward, like I said, don't hesitate to hit me up. And I, the, the thing I have the most hope for out of this, man, I hope with some of the other guys that were already on and then going forward, Maybe we get some of the guys that are more interested in something. Maybe it turns into one day something we get some investments or something going yeah. to man to get a gym here on the west side, and maybe it becomes the home of 270 Hoops or something. That's something I would well, love, I I would love to see. If I ever got man. a gym, I would love to see. If I ever got a gym, it'd be called the Playground at 270 Hoops. There you go. Because kids don't go to the playground anymore, so I'll create the playground that so you come the, to. Then, then yours will become the playground. I love and it. And if I ever had an event or if I ever had a gym, I'm going to have an educational wing because my wife's a teacher. She's always wanted to do tutoring. I'd have that type of wing, and then I'd hire some type of dietitian who would teach these kids about Even dieting. Even better, man. Now you're, really, now you're really hitting them. Because, my, man, you, if you live man. in some of these areas, like, you don't have grocery stores nearby. All you got is McDonald's, KFC, Wendy's, Taco Bell. And like, our parents weren't raised with the knowledge of it, man. They and weren't. They, and and, and they, it wasn't that they failed us in any type of way. They weren't given the tools, and, and now if you can, I love If you could feed your family for 12 man, bucks, you're going to do it. Even more, you just, you just made it even more... Ben- beneficial to what makes me feel good man because nutrition hits really hard to me i'm somebody who i almost came to like a near-death experience because of it and because of like 
uh, medication mixed with the way I was eating and all that type of stuff, man. I, whatever you need, man, let me know. And, and we're, I, I hope this really does turn into something like that for you. And I think, I think even if it's never something with me or exactly like that, right. this is going to turn into great things for you, man. And I'm really glad Thank that you. you did this. I appreciate it. man. I appreciate the opportunity. This was fun. Uh, I don't often get a chance to show my personal side. You know, when I do radio interviews on 97.1, it's always about Ohio State recruiting and people don't get to know me for who I am. And I think for those who may have thoughts and opinions on me, I think if they watch this, they'll get to know me a little more. And for maybe sure. And check that. out his social media too, guys. I mean, you'll get a better idea of who he is and, and that he may be very different from what you think, man. It, it's, it's From everything I've seen him from definitely what we've got today, uh, it's, Zach's an awesome guy. And, Thank you. And he needs all the attention he can get, man. I really appreciate this. And Don't tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, everybody, Zach Fleer. I appreciate it.